Thank you, Julius. Good morning. Um, my name is Lakimba Desadier. I am the Vice President and Chief Officer for Hill Collaborative, and I'm excited that you all are here in person and virtually. Um, we will be discussing, as um, Mr. Spears just said, our focus will be on biomarker testing, um, diversity in clinical trials when it comes to lung cancer, and then the policy aspect of that. Why is that important and how they all intersect? Before we begin, um, I want to say again, thank you again to our sponsor, Amgen, and we look forward to continuing this partnership when it comes to educating our community. We're going to start off this wonderful workshop with a personal story. Understanding the importance of patients having that story so that you're connected to that is important, and so we lead with your voices. Um, today we will have the voice of a lung cancer survivor, uh, Ms. Roxy Hall Williamson. Roxy? Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure, do you, you want me to go? Oh, is this good? Okay. <laughs> um, my story is really atypical, I've heard, for most lung cancer patients. I, though I have cancer in my family, and my mother is navigating COPD, I don't think anyone besides me has lung cancer specifically. And I don't, even to this day, have any of the typical symptoms. Like I don't, you know, bad cough, I haven't coughed up blood, none of that kind of stuff. But how I found out I have lung cancer is I began having some really bad headaches and eventually took myself to the emergency room and had emergency brain surgery like the next day. And from that brain surgery, when they removed the nodules from my brain, the pathology came back that um, I'm stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so that's how I found out. And um, I'm not sure what else <laughs> you want me to speak on. Um, as far as the biomarkers are concerned, I actually, when I attended the Lung Cancer Summit with GoTo.org uh, in Washington, D.C., I just asked my doctor um, what she knew about biomarkers, and she sent me my whole report, <laughs> which I had no idea that I had at the time, right? So um, I've looked through it, and of course, I don't really understand it. So I'm hoping um, for me today to get out of this workshop is to learn more about biomarkers, that I will have more informed questions to ask my medical team the next time I see them um, as far as navigating my treatments and my care. Thank you, Roxy. Um, your voice and your message was what we need to hear today. And when you being able to walk away with more resources and information is exactly what we want. So thank you for your voice. Thank, thank you so that. much. Next, we will have um, Dr. Fitzgerald, Michonne Fitzgerald. Shannon. Shannon. Oh, thank you. Fitzgerald. So I'm going to read your bio. Okay. Dr. Fitzgerald is a board certified physician in internal medicine, pulmonary, and critical care. She received her master's in public health from Tulane University. She has developed protocols for lung tissue banking in order to evaluate lung pathology including lung cancer for diagnosis and treatment. She has worked in both clinical and bench research in pulmonary disease. She has also served as a lab director. She currently divides her time between working in the ICU, the emergency room, and as a pulmonary consultant for lung cancer and risk management. Wow, thank you, that's a lot, thank you. She published several scientific articles on various pulmonary topics, including asthma and pulmonary hypertension. She is also a published children book author and an artist. That's a, you, how, how you do it. <laughs> Very impressed. So thank you, Sean, um, for that. And we're gonna, I'm going to pass the mic to you so that you can your presentation. Share your presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. It was <laughs> more glory than actually what I actually do. Um, Roxy, thank you, because your story is, you're right, it's just very atypical. 
And it actually points to something I really did not touch on very much in my presentation that definitely needs to be addressed. So, if we can go ahead and get started. Um, yeah. 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 So I thought there was going to be a little bit more people here, and I know online you can actually come in and comment, but there was a couple interactive questions, and so I'm just going to be, uh, you know, questionnaire and answer. <laughs> so let's get started. So thank you guys for having me. Next slide. So basically, what do you think? So the baseline knowledge of biomarkers is very confusing. Number one, because there's so many different terms to decide on what exactly is going on, but ultimately it's the same thing. What in the blood or in a tumor can we use to identify what this tumor is and what the treatments are? Who can best respond to these treatments and what treatments we should avoid? And all those things help not only for survival for the patient, it increases their tumor-free survival, it also improves their quality of life during this time. So, but what do you think? Just some basic questions. So, next slide. So, how many patients were estimated to be diagnosed with cancer in 2022? Let's see, uh, 100,000, 200,000, higher? Almost 2 million. Next slide, next slide. Almost 2 million. Wow. That is an extraordinarily a large amount of numbers. So, and there's a good portion that is of lung cancer. Lung cancer is...
biopsy and see if there are certain um, circulating DNA elements or, or these hormonal factors that are listed that we can test and see if it's there. Biopsy, I mean, people always say, you know, doing a biopsy or a section, uh, you know, is invasive. Of course it's invasive, but surgical procedures have, you know, have progressed to the point where most of it is invasive, but the risk of not doing it is less than the risk of actually undergoing, and the procedures themselves are much more benign. Uh, I've done tumor biopsies, gone in through someone's mouth into their, into their airway, you know, stuck a needle in through their airway into a, uh, a biopsy into their lung, and minimal, minimal, minimal side effects in incompetent hands. So, and then liquid biopsy. The liquid biopsy, we just talked about another way to analyze biomarkers. The only problem with the liquid biopsy is that it all can only test for a certain amount of those biomarkers. The tissue is still the best way to do it so far. Um, next one. Okay, so we, so we talked about the biomarkers can predict risk assess and to detect the disease earlier than what it would be. So it used to be that these biomarkers were only used as complementary tests. Now we know that sometimes we can actually use them earlier to help direct what next test we want to do. So instead of, you know, someone may have, if you do a, a blood test or you see that there's a biomarker that's present, instead of seeing going straight for a biopsy, you can say that this tumor marker means that they are at risk, but there's no need to intervene or to direct further care right now. You just monitor. Uh, in the guide treatment, of course, someone who is responding to the treatment or not based on their biomarker, um, based on the presence of that biomarker. Me. <clears throat> um, let's see. Cancer use of biomarkers, of course, to, to prescribe targeted therapies. Uh, lesser side effects than actually if you're going to get a larger, you know, sort of broad-based therapies, of course. But the big thing is that what people don't realize is to avoid treatment that's not going to be effective. Most of the healthcare expenditures in life actually occur at the end of life, when people are 80, 90 years old, dying in the ICU. That accompanies the highest amount of healthcare expenditure when we know that these treatments may not work. So we're, we're prolonging something, and I have a lot of people in my family die, and I, of course, I work in the ICU, but we're prolonging something that is going to occur anyway, incurring more costs and more burden to the family and as well as the healthcare system on modalities that are not going to work. So if we can reduce that, you know, that sort of pain and suffering for the patient, the family, as well as for the economic burden, that would be, that would actually change the whole healthcare system right there. Um, of course, you want to identify if, you, if it's going to recur or you have aggressive disease. Okay, next slide. Okay, so skip that one. Okay. So this is using it as, an, as, using that biomarker as that tool. So we have the disease, and we have the same drug and dose. So give it to this panacea of people, you, me, him, her, and that. That disease, those medications respond um, to, well, some people respond to a medication, and those people are outlined in that blue. You have the response that they want. Some of the people you would give the medication to doesn't do jack, just did not do jack. And you're like, okay, this is the same problem, this is the same solution, why did not, why did not have the same effect? But there are some people who will, if given that medication, they will have serious side effects. And they're on the next slide, okay, next one. Um, this is when you're using it with the testing. So you same disease, but you, you identify that this person responds to this drug based on their biomarker testing. So you give it to people, some people res respond to the standard treatment. Some people, you realize, based on the biomarker testing, that the it, uh, dose is not effective. I think you just spoke about, you know, how the, the, uh, the Reverend just spoke about, how do, do we know that, no, excuse me, that Reverend on TV <laughs> spoke about, you know, how do we know what dose is appropriate if, you know, African Americans are not in these clinical trials? The same way here. And we also know that, hey, this is too much, that their body cannot handle this amount of medication, a lower dose. Uh -uh. And of course, then the people you know that will not be affected by it are the people who will have severe consequences. Okay, next slide. Okay, so wait, did I skip the slide? Okay, no, no. So yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. So so basically, okay. So here's the patient that is going to suffer from this therapy. So this is the example patient. So there's a certain amount of people who cannot 
take certain medications. And one of the big medications that has been around for, and since at least the 1940s or greater, is 5-FU. 5-FU is used for a multitude of cancers. There are people with a genetic alteration that if you give them that medication, they, they not only will suffer severe chronic cancers, but they die, absolutely die. And, but this is what we use normally. This is one of those go-to therapies. Let me use this one, let me use that one. And the people who die are the people that we identify now have this mutation of the DPYD gene, which is identified with your biomarker testing. Okay, the next one. So here's an example. So this is a white woman example. I got it from the <laughs> Cancer Society Network. <laughs> and the other one was for uh, uh, African American male with prostate cancer, but since this one had one, um, had one cancer. She was symptomatic. So they ordered a CAT scan and they revealed the mass. So let's see what happens if she gets directed therapy from biomarker testing or no biomarker testing. Next slide. With biomarker testing, they revealed that she had a mutation called ROS1. She got ROS1 diverted theory. But without it, this is what happens. I know I'm supposed to be in a slide, but I got a point here. Can we see? Okay. So this is the course of a year. So in January, no testing was done, right? So the insurance company didn't cover for her. And then so they gave her the standard therapy. Let's give her you these rounds of chemotherapy and see how you respond. Oh, she didn't respond. Let's add chemotherapy. Let's see if you respond. She starts getting symptomatic from that treatment. She has multiple ER visits in order to see what was going on. She undergoes re-biopsy of that tumor to see why in the world is this not helping. Stay not working, switch to another chemotherapy. So this is third round of chemotherapy for a tumor that was not responding. Re-biopsy. Finally, the insurance company decides, we want to test for ROS1. She's ROS1 mutation gets appropriate treatment. That's a year. That's a year. Okay, next one. So, uh, one of the big things about biomarker testing is, of course, knowledge about it. Some providers are good at ordering their tests for biomarkers, some are not. But overall, when they query oncologists, pulmonologists, we do know that biomarker testing, you believe, can make more informed decisions for patients. 89% of people say they can make but a good portion of them said that the problem was the insurance coverage. Okay, next one. So the challenges to biomarker use is lab turnaround time. So with the biopsy, you usually get results of the, of the um, biomarkers between like two weeks. For the liquid biopsy, it can be up to four weeks. That's a lot of time when you're anxious about what is going on in your body. But it's critical to actually wait for this time because certain, if you give someone a medication that they're not it can do exactly what we saw in that patient there. Um, additionally, sometimes you won't get enough tissue when they take out a, a tumor in order to do the proper, um, the proper testing. Next slide. Um, the biomarker testing is, is coming out. Uh, so far, there's 50 cancers that we detected with biomarker testing. There are uh, seven to ten, three are coming down the pipeline as far as FDA approved biomarker testing when in, in regard to lung cancer. Um, these people benefit from the therapy once their biomarkers are revealed. Uh, are revealed. Okay, the next one. And this is, um, you guys may see here, I'm going to skip down that deadline because you can read, but HR2 mutations. I know you guys have probably heard of that before, right? In regards to breast cancer? So this is, this is the thing. We used to treat tumors based on where the location is, but we realized that certain tumors have receptors that you see in other parts of the body. So there are some lung cancers that respond to breast cancer treatment. So now we're finding what we have to know more than what we, we have to, being that we have this um, way to test for these markers. Let's see other medications that can help and actually improve patient outcomes. Okay, next one. What if you do all the testing and you, and, you don't, and you don't have a biomarker that's identifiable? What do you think you do? Clinical trials. So there are a lot of biomarkers that we have found, but we don't know what therapy targets that they are. What we, what we need to do is enroll in the clinical trials, and I think that someone speaks about that uh, later on. Clinical trial enrollment helps us real identify that we are, that we are have different of mutations, some of us, that once we identify, did uh, have targeted therapies for. 
unless we're participating in these clinical trials, then we don't know what can be the best effective treatment for us. If you don't also respond, of course, the standard therapy is going to be, you know, chemo or radiation, surgical resection. But don't give up if you have a tumor marker that has not been identified to be a target of a therapy. Okay. Um, sometimes, I think someone may ask, um, like, I, I have a cancer. I'm not sure if biomarker testing was done. Always ask your physician. You have a copy of your biomarker testing results? You can get a copy of your testing results. And then at that point, once you have the copy, you can also see, seek help from a second opinion. And that is, of course, your right to see second, second opinion because people may not know what therapies that they are amenable to. Okay. All right. Um, so overall, who benefit the testing? Most people. Even if a targeted therapy is not there, you can benefit by not undergoing treatment that will not work for you. Save time, money, and of course, undo harm from a therapy that may not be effective. And these are the ones that have uh, FDA-approved targets that we know of as of today. Tomorrow, there'll probably be another one that is approved. Okay. Yeah, mine is uh, the EGFR. EGFR. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think I went through a little fast. <laughs> Okay. Questions? Yes, I'm going to ask a couple of questions mm -hmm. and then I'll open it up to the audience, um, Dr. Fitzgerald. What are the most important questions patients should ask their healthcare provider about getting biomarker testing? So if you, so if <coughs> the most important question is, is my, will my tissue be tested for biomarkers? And if not, why are you not sending my tissue off for biomarkers? And once the biomarkers are here, what, what is the next stage? What do I need to do? So number one, test my tissue for biopsy, <coughs> for biomarkers, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me, now I have a cough. <laughs> that, that is the most important thing. It's like, what, what type of cancer do I have? <coughs> Was my tissue tested for biomarkers? What therapies are available for my biomarkers? Give you a second. <laughs> Give you a second. Mm -hmm. Yes. Those are the most important ones. Mm -hmm. So how should a patient decide on a biomarker testing? Um, <coughs> so are these tests done like in hospitals or yeah. is so most, no, most of these tests are done um, by outside facilities and mostly are done in academic centers or you know centers that are like cancer centers. But these can be sent by any pathologies, any pulmonologists, we can request these tests. <coughs> the, excuse me, that type of test uh, is not really dictated by the patient. <coughs> My God. Give you a second, Doc. Drink a little water. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're fine. No, you're fine. <laughs> All right. So the, so the patient really doesn't decide. There's a battery of tests that they do. Like one of the big ones is um, Delta Center for what they call comprehensive biomarker testing, which is like a panel of 50 um, biomarker tests for most, for most things. Sometimes uh, they, if they know, already know from like a pathology um, perspective, like what the biomarkers are from that, then they could send it to a, another more specialized test. Thank you. Is there any questions from the audience? The question was, does the average physician know about biomarker testing? No. Wow. No. Um, and, and that is unfortunate. We know about biomarkers for, um, you know, things like, you know, heart attacks and such. But for malignancy, no. No. It is, uh, I queried one of my partners um, who basically works in the ICU, and we, we were just doing like this little you know, quick thing. No, but no. Probably about 20% of us were able to have a discourse with a patient about biomarker testing for lung cancer or anything. Yeah, and, that, and, and that's sad. For a pure pulmonologist who's up to date on their boards, <laughs> yeah, you, you don't know about it, but you know, just out in the field, your primary care physician you may not know about biomarker testing. So not only do patients need education, we are lacking in our own education about these modalities of treatment. So if they don't know, how can they determine? Exactly. Yeah. Doctor kind of sucking it up. <laughs> I would say that. I would say it again. I didn't mean to. Mind. No. We, we physicians, we have, um, I'm not trying to get on the soapbox, but we have failed patients 
over and over again. And especially for, <clears throat> we just stick to the same old, same old. Um, one of the disparities, you know, of course we know that there's healthcare disparities, but the big disparity is us not, even African American patients, not learning about other modalities and telling our patients this and getting out there to reach there. And, and, and we have, I, I can't teach you, I don't know. You mentioned disparities. Why is biomarker testing not available for people of color? Is that a, a, a part of the, for diagnosed with lung cancer? Oh, it is. It is. It's it is. available. Unfortunately, a lot of us are going to be our advocates for our own health. Mm. And we need to learn about it because, like I said, a lot of physicians don't know about it. And it's sad. It's sad. But it is available. It is available. But the best way for us to improve that biomarker testing is the most of a benefit is for us to get the testing done. To get the testing done. So that seems like it's a takeaway. Can you give us three takeaways? Three takeaways. Biomarker testing is available. You have the right to have biomarker testing. And the limitation for biomarker testing as far as insurance and a payer, and that, of course, is working through the legislation. There should, be not that, there should not be that barrier anymore. And then there are treatments available based on biomarker testing that will improve your health and your survival. Thank you, Dr. Fitzell. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. That gives you. me hope. Thank you. You have a question? Yeah, oh. I've got, I've got a, a question. The point is this. We as, we're going to say African-American, black people, whatever. Mm -hmm. first, first problem we have with doctors that, that, that what we lose it is, and don't take this the wrong way. You scares when you speak too fast. You terrifies. We don't understand, and and and, and, and we'll walk away. And we gone, mm -hmm. and, and that's just true. You have to slow down, and and, and I, I, I maybe I'm looking for something I'm not, I can't get from you. Or something it's not black doctors or, or nothing like that. It's just doctors in general mm -hmm. because they know what they're speaking of. But when, you, when a patient come in and you rattle something off at them, they terrified. And then they don't understand. And then they forget half the stuff you said. That part. You, you know, come on. I, I mean, and, no, and, and that's what happens. No, that's exactly and, what happens. And, and so, you know, we go home, we say, I'm going back over there. Mm -hmm. I'm not going back. And that's exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, because just like me, I'm terrified. When I go to the doctor, I'm terrified of dying. I go to the doctor every, every time something hurts me. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I'm being honest. And my thing is, you can catch cancer from pretty much
if people weren't scared of, of, you know, being ill or dying, then there's something wrong with them. And there's something wrong with them. And, and it, it's hard. And it's going to take several visits and getting to have that established trust with a physician. And that's not going to happen if you're hopping in, hopping there, and hopping there. But you have to find somebody. And, then, and that's going to take some time. So I'm glad you found a team of people that are willing to listen to you and you have an established uh, a player in care. Yeah. But, um... <laughs> Go take your medicines now. Go take your medicines now. Just take your medicine now. No, but, uh, <laughs> Lord have mercy, Daryl. <laughs> I'm sorry. bio the bio thing mm -hmm. the bio thing I have people in my family mm -hmm. and I told y'all that I smoked for 40 years mm -hmm. so that's bad by itself mm -hmm. but uh, I, I looked at my 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 mom was had cancer but she got over it, it, it they clean, cleaned it out or whatever. Mm -hmm. My Amy had a poor, poor cancer. Uh, she had, uh, I think, breast. Uh, a lot of my cousins had cancer. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That, that makes me really, really scared. Uh, it's a, a lot of people in my family, even my uncle, my uncle, yeah. Now I'm just saying, now I'm just saying, I, I need, I, I, I want to know about the bio thing, but, but do you that that I can die from doing it? Not from doing it. Not, not from doing it. The best thing can help us figure out what's going on and what you're risking. And if it's, if, you know, if you know, there's some risk, you know how to go about it. I am so much better than you should be. And I think that's a very, you know, very proper move to sit here and just stand up and talk to you about your fears and your hope. That's amazing because that is not only how you use it, but what you do. But it also says how passionate you are and that you are concerned about your health. Yeah. That you want to be better. Yeah, I do. Why do you want to be better? Yeah. Uh, I, What's I, your name? My name is Summer. Summer D. Rose. Summer D. Rose. <laughs> What's your name? Somebody Rose? <laughs> I have a doctor, but I won't see him until uh, uh, till uh, no, Jan uh, no, uh, June, June. Okay. Are there any other questions? I'm going to sit down. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald, for being a human being. We appreciate that. Uh, I have one more question. <coughs> we got another question, Dr. Fitzgerald. Okay, I... I <coughs> I have cancer, and um, my father and brother passed from lung cancer. 
So um, my first question is, is biomarker and tumor markers, are that the same thing? Yes. Yes and no. Yes and no. So biomarkers are usually used um, in order to, a tumor marker says that a tumor is there. A biomarker sort of helps address what treatment is going to be best for that, for that tumor. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but, but they go hand in hand. They yeah. go hand in hand. So I get tested for two different tumor markers. Uh -huh. it, do, is there certain ones that you, that's checked for lung cancer? Yes. There are some that are just specific for lung cancer, yes. Okay. So right now I'm within the, I guess the lower end, uh -huh. end of what the high level would be for my markers, and uh, it's been that way for a couple of years now. Okay. So if it was to change, would it indicate it could be any other type of cancer? It, it could. It, it could indicate that it could be another uh, tumor that now another type of cancer that has the same markers as that original cancer, or it could show that that original cancer is growing. So it's one of the two. But your numbers have been stable for a couple of years? Yeah. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can't remember. I think one, one, one of the markers is 15-3 or something like that. And the other one is like 25 to 27. And the uh, normal is like 60 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact number. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, that's my question. Well, it's wonderful that you actually know. A lot of times people don't know what they're being tested for. It's great that you know what the, the normal, about what the normal range is and what, the, what they're testing for. So that's great. That's hey, great. One of you may have answered this before, but the biomarker, are they done just randomly or are they done once you have been, you've had a biopsy for? So, so they can be done pre-biopsy? Uh, and as it like a screening and sort of a predictor, and then of course with the biopsy, so so both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're welcome. Roxy, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, were you able to comprehend the biomarker results when you when you got them? No, ma'am. <laughs> I am still forming questions and listening and learning and yes, ma'am. And I actually have scans in the morning. When you were talking about, you have scans regularly. Um, I have labs regularly, so they're monitoring me pretty closely. But no, and that's why it was so important for me to be here today. Um, I just really want to hear and absorb information so I can be more informed <laughs> the next time I see my doctor to get more into the report and what it really means. And like I was saying, uh, the prevalent marker for me was the EGFR. And that's how my doctor decided that the Tegriso pills were the best therapy for me right now. And excuse me, I'm still new in the process. This is my first therapy. This is my first, you know, initiation into navigating the space. So it's just very important to me to be a part of this process. And I think like the last time, I'm very active with legislative issues. So now that I have more understanding about how to bring resources to this space and bring these types of events to educate us, the public, this is my favorite part of the civic engagement, right? Because I already just listening to the doctor, it's already helped me form some questions that I feel I will get a lot more understanding about really how to take care of myself better as I get through the process. I can tell you that this is completely unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, this is like the position level. Right, that is not and for me. Right. This, they need a patient handout. Yes, yeah, that part. This, this is what I'm saying. Because she sent everything to me um, and let me and told me, you know, we'll talk about it as we get, you know, we see each other again. But it's Greek. It's like Greek. Microcell Microcell like instability is a condition of genetic hypermutability that generates excessive amounts of short insertion of niches, mutations, and the genome. Okay. You and you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and that's scary, right? That's intimidating. And I have a whole college degree. I know how to look up words, right? 
<laughs> my, my, but look, and my mother is a retired nurse, and none of this makes sense. None of it. None of it makes sense. And But that's why this is so important, right? We have a whole doctor here that is looking at it, and she knows exactly. We need this broken down into layman terms in order for people to understand this is really what I'm being tested for, and this makes sense to me. Otherwise, you get all this. <laughs> And unless you have access to someone like this, you have no clue what's really going on. So to form even the proper questions for your physician is a challenge because you don't really know what you're asking. You have no idea what to ask. And the doctors will ask, well, you have any questions? Yeah, but I don't know what they are <laughs> because I have no idea what you just said to me. So piggybacking on what the gentleman said earlier, um, just as patients and as regular everyday people, that's why getting our folk to these kinds of events is so important. That's why these people in our community are so important and we have to protect them and support them and help them help us find ways to bridge these gaps. Right? Yeah, and I, really, I really love the fact that you, it's like, you know, let me know what I need to do to help you. Like someone, I have, I have one patient where I just, Basically, I just drew everything out. I mean, it was just, it wasn't like a crayon or anything like, anything like that. And I obviously, I, I talk and I use my hands a lot, and so I write on the board. But just even just doing simple, like, diagrams. She's like, that makes sense. I said, if you have this, then we do this. And if this doesn't work, then it goes here. If this works, then it goes here. Just showing it, just a little schematic. And that's Instead how me, do we do that, here. though? Like, yeah. how do we bring those resources together? And I would love to be able to work on a pamphlet about lung cancer that was just in plain language <laughs> for people. Because like I said last time I was here, um, it's, but even when you're talking about the smoking issue, right, you're not always talking to a group that's homogenous. You might have cigarette smokers, you might have cigar smokers, you might have weed smokers, you might have, you know what I'm saying? Like you have so many strata and you can't just attack it with one blanket thing. We have to make people understand that, you know, these cigar wraps, you know, might be a vaping, problem. Yeah. But in, in the vaping, like, there's so many strata to it. How do we chop that information down to target those audiences and make it make enough sense where people don't feel shamed but feel enlightened and want to know more and empowered and want to know more and want to get testing and want to... Because like I said, I had no idea. I went in on a Monday because I was having bad headaches. By lunch that Tuesday, I was having emergency brain surgery. <laughs> I didn't find out I had cancer until maybe two weeks later, three, four weeks later. Um, so it's just been a lot of information to, to synthesize. Fortunately for me, I do have a network, my mom and you know my sister and some other really close friends that you know, talk to me and help me at least express myself. But they have no clue what this is about. All they know is they love me, they want to see me have a good quality of life, and they want to see me navigate it as best I can. But they have nothing to add to this space other than supporting me. So how do we bridge that kind? Because I know I'm, I know I'm blessed. But I think about the people that don't have those resources. How do I bring that to my community and start connecting people to these resources. Thank you for sharing. Um, in that part you spoke about like advocacy um, is important. Um, yeah, advocacy like with you and your family and yourself advocating for yourself to push to make sure you get the answers because yeah, that's, you can't understand that and you need to understand it to know like how to proceed and go forward because you as a patient should be able to make the best decision for yourself and your body because you, you know your body better than the doctor does. Exactly. And you know people mean well but the number of people I've gotten, I was like, well, so-and-so had cancer and they did this natural thing and they, I'm like, boo, that's cute. <laughs> but I'm a science girl. You're going to have to make it make sense to me on a molecular level. Break you know what I mean? And I'm sure that, like I said, they mean well. And I'm sure that if we combine some natural remedies with a targeted remedy, those things can help. But we won't know that, like you said, unless we do the clinical trials or we do 
we can express ourselves to our medical personnel to maybe get some guidance, right? Yeah. Because recently um, I was told by another person on my medical staff that um, even though I love to be outside a lot, I love to be in the sun, I might want to think about a vitamin D supplement. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's something no, that we don't talk... Yeah. Right, you feel me? No, that's the color we are... By and large, 99% of people of color are vitamin D deficient. deficient. 90%. Didn't know. Just assume my melanin was popping. We need vitamin you know? D. <laughs> we need vitamin fun. D. But we need vitamin D, and I had no idea. Like I said, as a 50-something-year-old woman, that that's what I need. Because everything that I was complaining about, people were attaching to menopause. And, I'm like, <laughs> and it had nothing to do with menopause at all. It was my lung cancer. Yeah. Right? So... You get what I'm saying? So you know they mean well, but you know for yourself, like you say, you know your body, and praise God, I listen to mine, yes. and yes. I'm here now to be able to tell the story. Praise yes. God. Yes. Well, I, I did it for a while though, <laughs> and that was my that's my if I if I have one thing to share with everybody, don't push that down. If it hurts, tell somebody it hurts because I was one of those people. I'm. I'm learning how to heal those traumas that make us as black women feel like you don't have time to take care of yourself. And, you know, my kid's an adult now, and I'm by myself, so now I'm learning how to really listen to myself and take better care of myself. And I was hurting so bad, though. And I thought, and that's how I, I chastised myself, like, dude, did it really have to get this bad? And then, you know, that spirit in me say, yeah, because you're stubborn, and it got that bad, and you're, you're, you're working through it now, right? So I want to help people not go that far. Don't let it hurt you that bad. If it feels bad or you can't explain it, just try to get to somebody. Because from my experience, I couldn't even express myself. I was hurting so bad. But fortunately for me, the nurses that were on duty in the ER that day were just phenomenal. The one to my left was taking my information, and the one that was sitting, just like she's sitting next to me, basically told me what was going on with me. And I was like, I literally said out of my mouth, I feel seen, I feel heard, thank you. And it was just, and from there, you know, just everything aligned and everything is just going the way it's going. I got one of the best surgeons right before he retired. My medical staff, like Daryl was saying, are just, they're phenomenal. Um, I have a mix of UTMB students and MD Anderson doctors, so it's a really good balance of um, folk that can take more than two minutes with me and report back to the doctor. So when the doctor gets his two minutes, I feel like it's an effective two minutes, right? Because we get right to the thing, because I have all these other people to bounce my symptoms or side effects or whatever off of. And then they guide me, and then by the time I get to Dr. V, we've had all of this discussion, and he and I are doing the synopsis, and how do you feel about X, Y, and Z? I think the medicine is still working for you. We're just going to keep, like I said, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., I have to be in League City to get another scan because he wants to just make sure that those things that he's following are still on track. And I know for a lot of people, um, one of the questions when you do the MRI is, are you claustrophobic? If you are, speak up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Please speak up. Don't get in that machine and like lose it because you know you're hurting yourself. If you know that you have these phobias, tell them because it makes all the difference. Me, fatigue is a devil. So typically, when I do my scans, I just take a nap <laughs> because I typically need to sleep. At 7 a.m., I'm not good early, early anymore. So that 7 a.m. is going to be really hard. <laughs> but I'm going to be on time, and I'm going to get in that machine, and I'm going to go ahead and get that nap and let them do what they have to do. But it is a process, and that's another thing I would say to patients because we have a tendency to want things. But this is a process. And getting that biomarker testing, like I said, I didn't know. That's just, I think, protocol for my team and how – they work at that hospital. Um, so when I was in D.C. and I asked her about, because my question to her was, what do you know about biomarkers? And is there anything you can tell me now about my situation that I could possibly share? And she sent me the whole. <laughs> she sent me the whole. She was like, I'm sure there's someone there that can look at it and give you a little quick synopsis. We'll talk about it when you get back. And it, there was. There was another gentleman there 
that this is his wheelhouse. He's the scientist behind the test. And for him, it was important to connect with the real people that are receiving these targeted therapies because that's his work. But you get, like he said, you could get behind that lab, get in that lab coat and forget about people, right? You're just focused on the medicines. So again, these spaces <laughs> are very necessary. Thank you. And what so I really much. appreciate for you and Daryl, do a speak up. You say that you're scared. You know, I don't want this test. If it hurts, you know, do this to me. I've, we have a lot of patients who we're sending for a test, like an MRI, and then they'll, it's panic inducing. And then it'll be like months before they're able to go back and get the skin again because they're scared where I could just give you a little bit of medication, you know, before you go and get the test done. So They will hook you up. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get the best test done as soon as possible. But then now we've incited fear to the patient. Now they don't want to do like the, exactly. the next thing we have to do. So, so, so that so machine is noisy. It is noisy. And it's tight. <laughs> 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 and the nurses don't understand how I can sleep through it. But I can. <laughs> You. I but you do though you have to and if you can't speak up for you if you're really that shy take somebody with you that can speak because fortunately for me you hear I don't have any problems speaking for myself however my mom is my my touchstone so if I'm feeling overwhelmed, because a lot of information, I just try to make sure that she's with me. Um, and not all the time, because I feel like a big girl most days. But I do have moments where I'm like, Mommy, I'm not really sure what this is. Can you come with me? And, you know, just be with me. So if it's something that I really get confused about, I have somebody else there. Because like Daryl says, as a patient, you'll black out. Like, you'll just be like, okay, I don't know what's happening. But your other person is going to pay attention to the doctor while you're getting yourself together. So <laughs> they can write it down. Like I used to right. do a discharge summary or something that's even at the end of a, a just normal like pulmonary clinic visit. You know, I say, hey, this is what we talked about today. Here's the, the here's the synopsis. You know, call with questions. You know, something that you take in your hand and refer back to. And if you're savvy with your phone, I love my chart. That's how I get all yeah. my notes and send all my messages to my doctor, and they respond rather quickly. So That's good. Great advice. I have one more last question from online, um, Nadine from Facebook, um, probably for you, Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, she wants to know, are you at higher risk if you have COPD? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I do. Yes. I love you. You get right to it. No, no dancing around that. So with COPD, those are actually structural changes in your lungs. So as, as with malignancy, you have uh, structural changes in a cell. So these structural changes in the lung can also promote cancer. There are some people who say that, no, you're not really at, at that higher risk. But no, studies are now starting to elucidate that you are at higher risk for types of cancer. And even if you do not have cancer, having COPD puts your the increased risk of death no matter. There's a, also, it depends on also what kind of COPD you have if it's like bronchiectasis or some of the obstructive types. But yes, you are at increased risk, especially if it's from smoking. The other thing that smoking does, if it doesn't give you lung cancer or COPD, heart disease, part and parcel heart disease. So that increases your the risk of death as well. So if, you're, if you are smoking, you know, try to reduce, just start thinking about quitting. That, and that's all I can say about the smoking. And, and that's enough <laughs> on that. <laughs> Well, thank you both. Um, we appreciate your voices and your empathy and your direction and your honesty um, sharing on both sides, the patient and the physician. Thank you very much. We are going to jump into a couple of videos. Um, the first video will be from um, Kaylee um, Merrick, which is um, an assistant professor at Texas Tech University. She is a Department of Civil and Environmental Construction Engineer. Um, the video, then another video following that will be a, a personal story with regards to um, radon um, coming from the CDC. Immediately after that, um, we will have um, a Zoom <laughs> connection with... Um, well, thank you both. Uh, we will have a, a Zoom connection with Dr. Ajay Wale um, with regards to clinical trials.
So next we will be showing the facts on radon from Texas Tech University. Hello, my name is Kaylee Millerick and I am faculty at Texas Tech University. This presentation is to discuss radon in the state of Texas. I supervise a program called Texas Radon, which is a United States EPA sponsored initiative to provide free and unbiased information on radon risks to Texans. So what is radon? Well, radon is a naturally occurring radioactive gas. And by naturally occurring, I mean that radon comes from the soil beneath us. And that soil naturally produces low levels of this radioactive gas. Now, most of the time when radon is produced from soils, it travels upwards in the soil and dissolves naturally in the outside air. But occasionally, radon can travel upwards and become trapped um, inside households as it travels through the ground. Now, if radon does become trapped in households, it will um, affect the indoor air quality of your home and is available in a form where you can breathe it in. This is important because radon can cause lung cancer when breathed into human lungs. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States, and it is second only to cigarette smoking. Most homes do not have high levels of radon, but some do. And the only way to know if your home has high levels of radon is to conduct a quick, simple radon test um, within your home and the spaces in which you interact to make sure that that air that you're breathing in um, is safe and healthy for your lungs. So the Texas Radon Group provides information about radon to Texans. And what I am showing in this slide is just a map of Texas and relative radon risk. Now, the areas that you see in yellow are areas of Texas that may have radon, um, but radon levels tend to be low, which is a good thing. The areas that are depicted in orange are areas that are more likely to have higher concentrations of radon. Um, and so you can see Texas has both areas, the lower areas and the elevated rate uh, areas. However, no matter where you live in Texas, there is the possibility um, of having radon in your home. Now, what my program does um, is we are an information source about radon in Texas. And if you do have any questions about your home specifically, we are happy to answer um, anything that might come up. But our primary um, purpose is we provide free... Hello, my name is Kaylee Millerick and I am faculty at Texas Tech University. This presentation is to discuss radon in the state of Texas. I supervise a program called Texas Radon, which is a United States EPA sponsored initiative to provide free and unbiased information on radon risks to Texans. So what is radon? Well, radon is a naturally occurring radioactive gas. And by naturally occurring, I mean that radon comes from the soil beneath us. And that soil naturally produces low levels of this radioactive gas. Now, most of the time when radon is produced from soils, it travels upwards in the soil and dissolves naturally in the outside air. But occasionally, radon can travel upwards and become trapped um, inside households as it travels through the ground. Now, if radon does become trapped in households, it will um, affect the indoor air quality of your home and is available in a form where you can breathe it in. This is important because radon can cause lung cancer when breathed into human lungs. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States, and it is second only to cigarette smoking. Most homes do not have high levels of radon, but some do. And the only way to know 
if your home has high levels of radon is to conduct a quick, simple radon test um, within your home and the spaces in which you interact to make sure that that air that you're breathing in um, is safe and healthy for your lungs. So the Texas Radon Group provides information about radon to Texans. And what I am showing in this slide is just a map of Texas and relative radon risk. Now, the areas that you see in yellow are areas of Texas that may have radon, um, but radon levels tend to be low, which is a good thing. The areas that are depicted in orange are areas that are more likely to have higher concentrations of radon. Um, and so you can see Texas has both areas, the lower areas and the elevated rate uh, areas. However, no matter where you live in Texas, there is the possibility um, of having radon in your home. Now, what my program does um, is we are an information source about radon in Texas. And if you do have any questions about your home specifically, we are happy to answer um, anything that might come up. But our primary um, purpose is we provide free home radon testing kits and instructions to Texans that request them. Um, and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. Um, should there be radon in your area, we encourage national certification and standards for radon testers and mitigators. Um, and we've worked with neighborhoods all over the state um, to raise awareness and to increase testing because ultimately what we are trying to do is provide Texans the opportunity to test their homes and to address radon should it be present. So my program offers free home radon test kits to anybody who asks, and I would recommend that you request one. To request one, you can go to my website, which is offered through, uh, through Texas Tech University. I have put the URL at the top of this slide, or you can simply just search TTU Radon. Um, once on the web page, you can go to the main menu and, and select Request a Free Radon Test Kit. There's a short information um, section that we ask you to fill out with just your name and basic contact information, and we will mail you that test kit usually within approximately two weeks. Beyond that, you are welcome to contact my program um, should you have any questions specific to your home and radon. My name, again, is Kaylee Millerick, and my contact information is on the slide, um, as well as you can contact my program directly, which is radontesting at ttu.edu. Please do not hesitate to contact us should you have any questions. Um, again, what we are trying to do is make sure that your home does not contain a lung cancer causing gas. My name is Jackie Nixon, and I'm 73 years old, and I am a cancer survivor. I uh, always was one that was big on exercising, uh, eating right, so my health My name is Jackie Nixon, and I'm 73 years old, and I am a cancer survivor. I uh, always was one that was big on exercising, uh, eating right, so my health was perfect. I did never had the flu in my life. I got one cold, maybe a year. Um, I couldn't ask for more. The indication that I noticed something wrong was when I was singing. And for example, if I, can, if, if I sing a note, and you have so many beats to hold that note. I would get like half of the way and I'd lose air. And later on it became apparent that part of the reason was lung cancer. The first thought was 
oh my God, I'm going to die. I did think about, you know, uh, things I might have done in the past that might have caused it, but bottom line is, is that I, I never smoked a day in my life. I had the surgery and I was home for seven months. Once I was able to go back out again, I went to uh, a meeting and there was a gentleman there and it was a home inspector. Did you ever hear of radon? I don't, I can't explain it to you, but for some reason, I immediately knew that was it. I took my own money and I got the highest level monitors and I asked my neighbors because you have to test at the lower levels. So we tested the building and Rose's apartment came out to 18 picocuries. The government level, EPA, level guideline is four picocuries. I said, well, I know what I can do. And I decided that I was going to start my own advocacy, just basically start telling people. I think in specifically in Jackie's case, I mean, she was diagnosed with lung cancer in 2015. And that was in a, a very rapidly changing era for radon and lung cancer. Had she been diagnosed in 2000, we would have never even thought of her case as radon related. And so the timing of the two, her diagnosis and the, the, the growth in knowledge um, sort of coincided. And, and as time went by, in Jackie's case, as, as the years went by, um, she became like a, a healthcare hero. And she helped educate, you know, people around her, the general public, but also me, you know, because then I thought, wow, this is real. Pay attention to your health, period. Do not ignore things. Rain on affects your lungs. You may not have any symptoms, zero symptoms. So test your house for radon and know your numbers. and sharing the information on the importance of radon. Next, we will have a um, Zoom interaction with um, Dr. Veronica Ajewale. Dr. Ajewale serves as an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at Texas Southern University and is a clinical pharmacist and an adjunct assistant professor of oncology at Houston Methodist Hospital. She is also the Good morning, consultant. everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, doctor. I was just reading your bio. Okay. Is that okay? Is it time for me to get started? Or? She's reading your bio, uh, and oh. we'll, we'll let you know. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. We want to give you your shine, doctor. We want to give you Next, your shine. Next, we will have a um, Zoom interaction with um, Dr. Veronica Ajewale. Dr. Ajewale serves as an associate professor in the department. Okay, Dr. Ajewale received her PharmD from TSU and completed her oncology pharmacy resident at Houston Methodist Hospital 
and is the board certified oncologist pharmacist with clinical practice in the oral chemotherapy at Houston Methodist Hospital Cancer Center. Dr. Ajo Wale also enjoys serving in quality time with her husband and her four children, also serving her patients, students, community, and church. Doctor, can Do you hear us? Hear us? <laughs> yes, I can. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you Thank for you joining us. Joining I'm going to pass it out to the Okay, I will go ahead and share my screen. I believe that's my cue. Just give me a second. Okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? And can you all hear me? Perfect. Good morning, everybody. And thank you all for joining uh, in this incredible conversation. I want to say a big thank you to the organizers of this um, um, workshop, the Ill Collaborative and the church and everybody from the community uh, for joining in this very important conversation. And thank you for inviting me to have the opportunity to speak with the group um, about diversity in clinical trials. I apologize, I am not able to join physically in person, but I am grateful for the opportunity and the support from the tech team to have allowed me to give this presentation virtually this morning. And thank you for that uh, incredible introduction. And uh, my name is Dr. Veronica ajewa Lebuema, a clinical pharmacist in background. And uh, over the next few minutes, we will spend some time to talk about diversity in clinical trials. And then uh, we'll be able to take some questions and have some you know, great conversations at the end of my presentation today. So just starting off with a few disclosures. Uh, to know that the statements into these presentations, they are mine alone, and this is based on my research and my experience. They do not represent Texas Southern University, which uh, that's the institution that I am an associate professor at, or Houston Methodist Hospital, which is my clinical, pharma, uh, clinical pharmacy practice site nor does it represent the view of NIH, CPRIT, CDC, or CMS, which are all government entities that I have opportunities of having a grant funding mechanism from. So I just wanna you know, give that disclosure uh, before we begin. So uh, very briefly, we're gonna you know, talk a little bit about what clinical trial is, uh, talk about the current diversity trend when it comes to lung cancer clinical trials and then you know why is it important for us to take a closer look at uh, clinical trial diversity is it even an important topic and I want to acknowledge you know the speakers that have gone ahead of me uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, Ms. Roxy, thank you for sharing your personal stories Thank you, you know, to the audience for the engagement that you've had and even for the video that we just saw because everything pretty much sets the pace ahead of, uh, you know, the discussion that we are going to have today. So I'm going to start by looking at what is clinical trial. Some people call it clinical research, some call it clinical trial. But uh, the summary, honestly, when you look at clinical trial is pretty much the very long road. And it is truly a long road that leads to a new medicine. And that new medicine could be, you know, medications that might be taken by mouth. You know, like Ms. Roxy said, she is on Tegresol or Simatinib, which is an oral medication. It could be medication that is taken intravenously. It could also be a biomarker, like, uh, you know, Dr. Fitzgerald said. And when we look at this, you know, pretty wiggly road, you know, leading to this new medicine breakthrough that we call clinical trial, clinical research, it basically starts with an idea. Somebody that is working in the lab, somebody that is involved in patient care, somebody that is involved in clinical research has an idea 
and they go into discovery and that discovery process you know if you look at the map sometimes you have to go back in cycles and go around and round and round you're looking at chemistry you're looking at robots you're looking at computers and of course before anything makes it to human it is first tested in animals so that's why we had the uh, the mouse model there and then, you know, taking it through regulatory practices to then getting it into human. Then the whole process of full development. Again, you can see that sometimes you have to segue, you have to go backwards, you have to, you know, make detours before medications eventually gain full registration under governmental uh, strict regulation by different governmental entities for it to be made available for human use. So I think this slide is pretty much, you know, a summary of uh, the long road, which indeed it is long, because when we take uh, statistics, uh, several medications that start as an idea or several biomarkers or several initiatives that start as an idea do not make it to the market. And just to point out the fact that there are several regulations, you know, um, along the way. Then when we look at the stages of phases of clinical trials, uh, there are the first stage is considered preclinical trial where okay the person is conceiving the idea and things are being done in the lab setting you know just to confirm that this is not just a random idea is this something that will be useful and safe when it gets into human then once it passes through preclinical uh, trial phase then it goes into phase one phase one is the first step in human uh, you know, uh, for, for the medication or the biomarker or the in intervention to be tested in human. This is a very controlled study. This is a very controlled phase where you have very few people participating purposefully because this is the first time that, you know, such intervention is being given to humans. So you want to control, you want to make sure that the benefits of uh, you know utilizing such intervention is better or greater than the risk that might be involved. If such intervention medication passes phase one, then it advances to phase two. With phase two now, the test is really to evaluate is this safe and is it doing what it's supposed to do. So you're looking for safety and efficacy. Of the uh, of the drug, this again has a few patients, less than a hundred participants typically, and then phase three study is when you now advance it to more participants, looking at a few hundred population to really confirm the benefits and safety of treatment. Typically, medications do not make it to the market. That means for available for human consumption until it passes phase three of clinical trials. So I'm bringing this to mind to say that most medications that you see on the market has gone through each of these very rigorous steps before they are made available to the market. There are cases where, you know, under emergency use approval, medications could be approved sooner, but for the most part, phase three is where, you know, there's more uh, confidence before medications are released. And then phase four is now, okay, medication is already in the market, in the real life setting, day-to-day -day setting, how is this medication benefiting? Uh, <laughs> and are there any risks associated with the use of such interventions? So, what then is the current diversity trend in lung cancer clinical trials? The speakers that went ahead of me, you know, they spoke uh, effectively about the fact that lung cancer unfortunately remains a major cause of mortality among uh, minority populations, especially among African American populations. But like we can imagine, the medications that is being used to treat lung cancer, do we even have repre representation of African-American population in that study? So this is um, a slide that is showing one of my publications where I looked at cancer disparity and black community representation in clinical trials that led to oral chemotherapy approval 
over a 10 year period. And I know on this slide, I am representing three different cancers. The first one being non small cell lung cancer, the second being breast, and the third being prostate. I chose these three uh, cancers because these are the top three causes of cancer related mortality among black and African American community. The very first one, when you look at lung cancer, right? You can see that the red bar, which is Asian, has 55.7% representation. White has 42% representation. But when you look at black community, it's 1.12. That is totally disheartening. And you know, I must say, one of the, the medication that I made reference to, osimatinib, which is Tagriso, is actually one of the drugs that is included in this uh, in this uh, review that I published uh, last year. Because lung cancer is one of those cancers where EGFR, which is one of the biomarkers that Dr. Fitzgerald talked about earlier, it's very inclusive and it allows for targeted treatments, which allows for the use of medications by mouth. That is oral chemotherapy. But unfortunately, we don't even have enough representation of African American, black, brown community in this, uh, you know, disheartening disease state. So um, I will take us further by reviewing this short video of a uh, a cancer, uh, someone that was diagnosed with lung cancer. Let's just listen in uh, for this very short video. You can imagine, you can imagine. my thing. Uh, uh, learned that I had this stage four lung disease. Part of the challenge is in the African-American community, we don't have a lot of data because many African-Americans don't participate in clinical trials. They had some research studies underway and they asked if I would be interested in participating in it and I said yes. Yeah. So the I'm sorry, there is an echo somewhere. Okay, I think it's gone now. Sorry about that. Uh, the video we just saw is from, you know, the American Lung uh, Cancer Society and reflecting on <laughs> our <laughs> Where she was able to... <laughs>
researcher that is involved in clinical and basic research to undergo mandatory clinical research so that they are able to conduct research in a safe and efficacious manner. Again, another very recent um, incident talking about accountability, talking about taking ownership. The FDA, which is the body that you know provides guidance from a governmental standpoint for uh, medication approval, has taken an important step to increase racial and ethnic diversity in clinical trials. Because we all know that if African American brown black communities, if they are not represented in clinical research leading to medication approval, leading to breakthrough drugs, leading to biomarker identification, we just don't know what is going to work for us. We don't know if it's going to be the right dose, we don't know if it's going to be the right medicine. So now we are more proactive, there is more proactiveness from medication standpoint, from governmental standpoint, even from a public health standpoint, and as well as a healthcare provider standpoint. I'm going to share another video again um, about uh, one of the healthcare providers talking about clinical trials specifically with lung cancer. When uh, African Americans participate in clinical trials, not only do they get access to cutting edge therapy for lung cancer, they also pay the bill for people of the same ethnic group to benefit from uh, the clinical trials. I am passionate about improving health outcomes in our community, which is why I care so much about educating the patients on clinical trials. Okay, so thank you to that video from American Lung uh, Association. And now I have another video again from Pastor Carly from Clinical Trials. And this is from the American Lung uh, Association. And this is actually one of the local pastors here in the East in the area. Most people, they are not aware of clinical trials. If no African American has taken the drug, how will you know if they're working? How can you know how much to give them? How can you know all of the possible adverse effects? There's so many good things that could come out of a clinical trial if, in fact, the numbers are equal to the population. Yes, so again, you know, reflecting to say from a community standpoint, from a support system standpoint, there is a lot of mobilization. That's why I'm grateful to be still collaborating, you know, for a this platform for us to have this engaging conversation this morning. This uh, slide here is looking at the data of some of the studies done by the American Lung Association, uh, specifically looking at ways to improve lung cancer clinical trial enrollment. A portion of this study was done here in Houston. You know, we are very grateful that we are in Houston, big Houston, Texas, and that most participants that completed the survey, uh, they agreed that most, uh, you know, the impact of clinical trials will be felt with people of color, right? And that most of them are least afraid of getting either a placebo versus real medicine in clinical trial. And most people agreed that trial does not mean that you will be treated differently. So people are treated the same regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of your sexual orientation, or you know, whatever the bias might be. Then uh, when it comes to the top five reasons for people participating in clinical trials, it's because most of the participants uh, 
patients that take it on consent for one week, two weeks, three weeks, discuss it with your family members, you know, if it's a family support with you, because you don't, you never want patients to feel the brush, we never want patients to feel obligated to participate in clinical trials, and of course, also consider the ease of getting that process. When you look at the risk of participate, there are also barriers to participation. Some of them is the fear of the negative side effects, because truth be told, this is medication that is still being developed. However, think back on the slide that I showed earlier, phase one, phase two, phase three. So it's not just something that's coming straight out of the bench top. This has been tested in animals, it's been tested you know, in phase one study, you know, so that that way as much as possible, all the adjunct there the effect that could potentially happen is being uh, documented. And of course, if a patient is participating in clinical trials, there are opportunities to discuss, you know, frankly, whatever side effects can happen. And definitely, as humans, there is a fear of the unknown because you just never know what might happen. There is a fear of being frustrated. There is lack of time for appointment because with clinical trials, yes, there will be need for additional testing. There might be need, you know, to come in for visit a little bit more frequently. And of course, the relationship between the provider is very, very key. Uh, top three information for decision making was payments. You know, we all know that cancer treatment, unfortunately, remains very, very uh, expensive, you know, here in the United States. So, in the setting of clinical trials, for the most impact, the cost of the drug is covered at the 100%. So, we know that an opportunity is for cost saving for some population, and there are benefits that come with that as well. Sometimes it provides a big package, sometimes it provides assistance for transportation. You know, those kind of make things easy, and the time commitment might also be. Ways that people learn about clinical trials is through their physician and the hospital meeting room, as well as advertising online. So, um, I've talked quite a lot for the past several minutes, and this entire uh, workshop has, you know, focused a lot of attention on, you know, clinical studies, biomass, and, and engagement. So, I would say that at this point, what's next, right? For every one of us listening online, those that are in person, on site, and those that will be listening to this in the future, I would say that it really does take each and every one of us. We said it earlier, history precedes us. It's not something that does happen overnight. But there are steps that have been taken and that will continue to be taken to mitigate such negative uh, outcomes. But ultimately, for us to see the needed diversity of clinical research and a positive trend to lay a legacy of health equity in lung cancer specifically that we're talking about today, we all need to do that change, right? We need to change the story and say, yes, it's a sleepy apple, and red a lot apple, but hey, we also know that there is a consent. You know, you can go find out information from the government. You know, you can talk to your provider. You know, you can see a second So you can be the type of see what that is trying to give you in your record, right? That's something that you can all advocate for and embrace the topic. So, and we do say that it also takes all of us to be the Google to champion the cause of our community, of understanding black Thank you, Doc. We do have some questions from the audience. Hi, Dr. Wajalim. Will it? Oh, I'm echoing. I'm echoing. <laughs> I'm still echoing. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's Dr. Fitzgerald. 
I think, think that clinical pharmacists are completely underutilized for patient care and education. Oh, stepping back. Okay. What do you think that physicians can do in order to help patients be engaged with the pharmacists and clinical pharmacists in order to not only improve their own health outcomes, but to help them engage and enroll in clinical trials? question and a comment. Uh, first of all, we talked about the relationship between physician and patient. The problem a lot of us have, those of us who have those relationships, is next year they may not be in our plan. I've established this concrete relationship, doctor and I on first name basis, and then next year when I need to follow up, I find out that they're no longer in my network. And I'm facing some of those challenges right now. That was a comment. I'm not sure if you or anyone on the panel would like to make a comment about that. But that's one of the things that a lot of patients deal with. Um, clinical trials, uh, in, in terms of the pharmaceutical side of it, a lot of us don't even know that that part exists. You just know about maybe a clinical trial, you've heard about it, but how do I qualify? I have this great relationship with this doctor. They mentioned to me that there's this new medication coming out, but we need a clinical trial population. Would you like to be included? Yes. But by the time I get to that point, that doctor's not in my network. So how do we get past some of these obstacles? And you may not have the answer. You may just want to shake your head with me too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but that was my comment and my question. Thank you very much. That is such a tough comment and question. And honestly, we run into that every day. That's it's unfortunate to see that the landscape of the healthcare system in the United States is far from perfect. And most people will agree with me on that. Because you know, like you said, you take time to do the relationship with your provider. And you know, something happens, they are no longer in your network, or no, you know, some insurance restrictions, it's no longer allowing the patient to reliably communicate with their provider because now they have to change. So, those are things that are more on a policy standpoint that all we can do honestly is to continue to advocate, right? Write a letter to the legislation, write a letter to, you know, the, the, the leaders, elected officials in our society, in our community, to help support you know, some of this sustainability. Because there are so many uh, provider-patient relationships is multifactorial. It's not just dependent on the provider being present. There is insurance, there is access, there are so many factors that come into play. But what can be controlled for, you know, should be controlled for. But if the provider decides to retire, then yes, we can control for that. If the provider switches place of practice from hospital A to hospital B or relocates from instinct to 
San Antonio, we cannot control for that. But things like insurance driven um, enforcement to change provider in and out of network, these are things that could potentially could be discussed on a policy uh, level. And I'm glad that I think the next session after this is going to talk a little bit about legislation and policy that you know we just need to continue to advocate, you know, uh, for such things. And then um, when it also comes to you know the, the, the relationship that we build with our patients, uh, or as a patient, you know, as a patient myself, right? You know, I just have to know that there are things that my physicians might not be able to control. So also knowing that okay, I build that relationship and that that might change. Then to your second question about uh, the the uh, eligibility to participate. Every clinical trial has its own criteria. So even if the physician might say, hey, Veronica, there is a trial that might be well suited for the ABC, do you want to consider if you want to participate? The patient might be willing, but the patient might be ineligible due to some certain criteria. And these criteria are set in place because of uh, safety reasons, you know, one, number two, it could be because of efficacy reasons, or number three, it could just be because of a pre-existing uh, norms that now, you know, someone like me and several of my colleagues that sit, you know, in clinical research protocol development, we are taking a look at it and saying, okay, does this criteria really need to be there, right? We just don't copy and paste and make the protocol standard because making a protocol standard would mean you are going to exclude X amount of patients when that criteria is really not necessary. So <coughs> factors are put in place for eligibility criteria because of safety, efficacy, and some are just even logistic related. But it is again quite multifactorial, multifactorial in nature. But before a patient can enroll in the study, you have to meet uh, each of those uh, uh, involvement criteria. Um, this is something we're about to share. Some, some, um, this also is the mic. Um, <coughs> um, some insurance carriers will accept an appeal. If you have this this primary care physician, you've been with them this amount of years, you make an appeal to the insurance company themselves and say, I need to stick with this provider. And then your provider will, can fill out another form as well in order to have you stay within that network. So some of the Blue Cross Blue Shields has honored them as of last year. They have honored them. Um, another, another thing you can do is you can, <laughs> another thing you can do, we can talk offline. You, uh, and then yeah. you? No, 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 here in Texas. No, 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 no. We, we have switched because our mission. But anyway, there's also, I'll talk a lot of other things. Thank you, Dr. One last question. Um, what are health concerns you have with regards to clinical trials and research? Could you repeat that? I, I didn't hear clearly. Yes. yes. What, what health concerns do you have around clinical trials and research? Sure. So typically patients would be concerned if they have pre-existing, uh, you know, health issues, right? So as we know that most patients that we see, you know, not everybody is healthy. So some people could have diabetes and there might be a need to enroll in a clinical study on cholesterol management, for example. So each of those health-related concerns we need to be openly discussed with the physician to see, okay, is there any potential risk that might negatively impact a pre-existing comorbidity or a pre-existing disease state, you know, that will put the patient at a greater risk if they do participate in clinical research. But within the clinical research setting, once the patient enrolls, there are, you know, uh, pretty uh, itemized steps that needs to be followed, you know, when it comes to uh, lab work that needs to be done, monitoring that needs to be done, you know, blood pressure checks, blood glucose checks, sometimes they need to be EKG, they need to be able to additional, uh, you know, imaging of what, what might be needed 
to ensure the safety of the patient while the patient is on the treatment. And even if a patient reports a side effect, then they are also included in the protocol on how to manage those side effects. Some could be okay, maybe an additional medication could be taken to help. Some it could be dose reduction of the original uh, you know, uh, medication or the original medication that is being used in the clinical trial. Or sometimes it could be okay, this side effect is too much, the patient needs to discontinue uh, you know, the clinical study. So the health and wellness of the patient is definitely important and that is something that will not and should not be overlooked in the setting of a clinical trial. And most physicians that are, you know, really good, you know, when it comes to clinical trial enrollment, will tell patients, and I do tell patients often, you can discontinue a clinical trial at any time, at your will, with or without this. So don't feel obligated, like, oh my goodness, I'm stuck in this, I can never stop. No, that should not be the case. Any patient at any point in time can and should be able to continue or discontinue clinical trial with or without this. And of course, if it's side effect related, then that will be discussed. Or if the patient experiences disease progression, so the patient is on a clinical study and the, the, the lung cancer, for example, is not, uh, is, continues to grow, then you will need to take the patient off the clinical study and put them on a different type of treatment. So, the baseline health, comorbidity, or health related concern of the patient will always be Thank you, doctor. I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked Dr. Fitzgerald. What are the three takeaways you want everyone um, on Zoom and, and here in the, in, uh, in the church to take away from this presentation? Yes, thank you very much. I think, you know, what we can take away is the fact that there is history. You know, history precedes us. There is the PD, there is Eric Talat. Those are the two most common ones. There are so many other stories that I will not allow us to share. So us recognizing that yes, that is happening. We are not dismissing that fact. It happened. But the other thing to also know is that now steps have been taken. You know, you know, Clinton in 1997, you know, rendering that public apology, all the legal uh, regulations that have been implemented in form consent, training, all these things have been implemented to help make clinical research more transparent to help make clinical research more regulated and make it a more trusted process. And the third thing is that we should not just hold back on history and not make an attempt to revise the history or to revise the future. Because if we hold back on what has happened in the past and say we will never participate, we will never be involved, we will never talk about clinical trials, unfortunately, lung cancer and so many other diseases will or might continue and black and African Americans are not represented in these studies, then it comes back to autos because we don't know is it even the right medication, is it the right dose? So those are the three main things that I want to discuss today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time, Doctor. We appreciate it. Okay, we're gonna segue into our last um, panel discussion. We've gotten a lot of information today. We've, we've heard from a personal story in person. We've had our own testimony. We've heard personal stories on videos. We've heard from two phenomenal doctors understanding the importance of lung, heart, lung cancer, the biomarker testing, the importance of clinical trial. And now let's talk about the intersection of all of them, how all of them are important, but in order for them to be successful and impact our communities the right way, policy has to be behind them. Everything that we do in life is connected through policy. The way we eat, the way we breathe, the way we move, our health, all of that is connected through policy. And if the right policy is not in place to impact our community and educate our community or give resources to our community, it will impact us negatively. Um, I do want to acknowledge that Senator Boris Miles and Representative Sean Theory would have been here today. Um, they are doing what they have been elected to do. Um, the speaker required that the state legislators be in Austin today. So they're there working with their colleagues, trying to fight um, the fight for our community. So I do want to acknowledge them and appreciate the fact that they 
um, were willing to be here, but because of the speaker, they were not long, able to be here. I want to kind of talk about just some key points with regards to um, lung cancer, particularly when it comes here in, um, to Tex in, here in Texas. Lung cancer is a significant public health concern, we've heard that, and policy discussion around it should focus on prevention, early detection, and treatment. Um, we heard earlier that in 2021, it estimated over 2,680 new cases of lung cancer would be diagnosed here in Texas. Americans here, in African Americans, I'm sorry, in Texas. African American men in Texas have the highest lung rate incident rate of any racial ethnic group, with a rate of 72.6 cases per 100,000 people here in Texas. African American women in Texas have the second highest lung cancer incident rate among women with a rate of 47.9 cases per 100,000 people. African Americans in Texas also have a higher mortality rate for lung cancer compared to other racial ethnic groups. The lung cancer death rate for African American men in Texas is 56.6 deaths per 100,000 people and for African-American women, it is 39.6 deaths per 100,000 people. That's big. So we talk about, we need to talk about smoking prevention. During this um, policy panel, we'll talk about uh, smoking prevention. We'll talk about early detection, the importance of early detection. Access to the treatment. So once you get it, how do you access it? Um, research, the funding to put into that, and then, as we they mentioned earlier with radon, the environmental factors. There is not just smoking; it's it's factors, environmental factors that we need to pay attention to. So, ooh. <laughs> that must be you. Um, I'd like to welcome to uh, this table talk. Let's call it a table talk. Um, Sitting right next to me is my friend and colleague, former state representative Howard Mosby from the state of Georgia. Representative Mosby served as the Georgia legislator over 15 years, sitting on the powerful Health and Human Resource Committee. In addition, he has over 25 years of healthcare experience at one of the nation's largest safety net institution housed in Atlanta, Georgia. And if that isn't enough, He gets on my nerves. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just want to make sure y'all paying attention. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He is a financial expert as a licensed certified public accountant and is a chartered global management accountant. We will be discussing the importance of policy. Why do we need state senators? Why do you need House representatives? Why do you need to make sure that these people that you vote for or don't vote for have the power to implement policy and legislation that will not just impact you, but generations. So, Mr. Mosby. Yes. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Okay. So, I just did this spiel. Why is policy makers, why are policy makers important? Um, great question. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank um, the South Texas District Association, uh, Pastor Jefferson, for the head of this house who allowed us to be here, Reverend Jackson, who was our, our moderator, um, welcomer. Yes. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's an important honor for Heal Collaborative to be here. I'm also one of the founding members of, of Heal Collaborative as well. Um, policy is important. You know, I, I hear a lot of times people saying, I'm apolitical. I don't want to get involved in politics, <laughs> nothing of that nature. And I, I thought about that for a minute and I said, um, if you went to a restaurant and you smelled something that was horrible, and you didn't say something, 
and the person sitting at the table next to you got up and said, that is the best smelling food I had in my life. Who do you think the restaurant's going to listen to? And so for a lot of times, we don't, we don't engage in the political process thinking that it is going to work for us, and it is not. You have to not only go push the button, you're going to have to also knock on the door of your legislator. And as Lakimba said earlier, there is nothing that's going on in your life right now that, that, that's not affected by policy. If somebody in here can tell me something that's going on in your life that hadn't been affected by policy, I'd like to know what that is. Because as a, as a former policymaker, I know that um, in this country, in America, everything goes through either your local, your state, or your federal government. And if you're not actively engaged in that, you're not at the table, then guess what? You're on the menu. And that's why it's important for us to be involved in the, in the political process. Local, state. local level, you said, you said local. State, I mean, a uh, county commission or city council. So Houston, uh, the Houston City Council or uh, what county is this? Uh, Harris. Harris. All this is Harris County. Okay. That's okay. Just, but anyway, Harris <laughs> County Commission has their, their um, governing authority. And then the state of Texas, down at your state capital in Austin. So they, they're dealing with that. Then you got your federal representatives. So you have uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, and you have uh, your other federal representatives that represent Texas. And then you have your state, your uh, U.S. senators. And then you got the President of the United States. And so that's how your whole government is affecting your life. Thank you. I, thank you for setting that tone. Um, so our focus is lung cancer and biomarker testing. Um, what policies do you think we need to address? or policy makers should be addressing with regards to high rates of lung cancer in our population? So great question. So um, we all know that, and we just heard this whole conversation around prevention. Prevention is key. So uh, preventing people to start to, to, to not uh, get into smoking. You, we've seen a number of campaigns go on about um, trying to curtail smoking. But that, that is just a piece of the puzzle. There are policies that can be put in place to, to curtail the access to cigarettes or access to, to um, the carcinogens that come through the, the smoking um, environment. Because there are a lot of people out there who think that uh, these e-cigarettes and uh, the hookers and all that mm -hmm. is safe. And it is not. Matter of fact, if you are in a hooker bar, hook up. Let's make sure we straight here. <laughs> Hookah, I think you meant hookah, hookah bar. Not, not hooker bar. Like, like, I don't know what that is either, so let me just say that. Uh, but if you're in a, in a hookah bar, every minute that you're in there is like smoking a pack of cigarettes. You're in an hour at 60 packs of cigarettes. So wait a minute. So my little cousins in their 20s, they, they're going to these bars in their 20s, and they're hanging out, and... It's big. Yeah. And, I don't know that. Yes. But I'm saying, mm -hmm. it's, and they're smoking the different flavors, and this is like how many packs is it? Per minute? One. That, pack. That pack. Because it's very concentrated. They, they are able to concentrate a lot of the, um, the effect of the, of the experience in a short period of, of time. So, so where do the policymakers come in with this? So, so first of all, there, there isn't enough research in this area that's being done right now. Uh, and that, that's also political. So there are, uh, if you look at something like gun violence, for instance. Oh, uh, money. You're talking about money. No, it, well, actually, the uh, federal government and state government okay. uh, prevent uh, researchers from going, going after doing research on gun violence. Oh, there's laws. There are policies. Oh, yes. Policy. And, and, and it also prevents the ability to be able to fund mm. that kind of research. So there are some people who are independently wealthy that can do that kind of stuff. But for the most part, most of our researchers that are in the space look for funding and usually it comes from the government and the government saying we're not going to fund research around gun violence. So if you look at uh, tobacco use right now, mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's, there are a lot of um, 
there's been a lot of funding around what tobacco has done, the, the usage of t tobacco, what it's done to individuals. The tobacco industry, though, is still a powerful lobby. And, and we, we could talk about later about how, how bills become law, but that lobby uh, has embraced the, um, the electronic cigarette, the hookup package, and they're also pushing for that this is safe. This is not cigarettes. This is not burning tobacco. So therefore, we shouldn't be looking at it the same way. And they're lobbying your legislators, you're lobbying your federal and your state legislators that this is something that they don't need to be paying attention to. And that's something that the community's voice has to raise up and say, we want somebody looking at whether or not my kids, myself, am I being put in danger around this secondhand smoke that's happening from this process? Because is it, in fact, dangerous or not? Okay, so you just mentioned about talking about how to build the ball a law. So let's, let's just start with this issue. Okay. I have a challenge. Uh, my children or my nieces or cousins are the hookah police. What do I do? I'm seeing they're, they're in and out the hospital. Who should I contact? What, what do I need to do? Walk me through the bill process. Us the bill process. Well, well, well. It's multifactorial. Okay. So we're, we're going to talk in general because this, what the question that was uh, was asked was how do you actually start the process of I see an issue and I want it to be addressed by the legislative process. I want to advocate. I want I want to advocate for it. So uh, contacting your elected official, number one, to express your concern about this particular issue is key. Uh, a lot of us do not approach our our elected officials. Let me just say this: in the state of Georgia. When I served uh, at the state capitol, when we're in session, same thing here in, uh, in, in Texas, up in Austin, when you walk through the halls of the capitol, the number of people that I run into that look like me, I can count on one hand. But now other folk are advocating for their stuff. And so the first step is you have to engage in the process. If you're not willing to make that first step in saying, I'm going to contact my elected official to say, I have this concern, I'd like for you to start working on it, then it'll never get worked on unless somebody else brings it up as an issue. It is, it is imperative for all of us who participate in this process to participate in this process. It's more than just voting. It's actually going in and, and having an active role in how policy is being made. So you contact your elected official and you, you explain your case. Now your elected official can do one of two things. <laughs> well, that was, the, that was the second thing. <laughs> he, gonna, he, could, he'll, he or she will pay attention and say, hey, this, is, this sounds like a great idea, something I can get behind. Or, glad you came by. Here's some literature. I see you at the uh, church when I come by to tell you I'm running for office again. And so those are the ones you have to say, hmm, I came by your office. When did you come by my office? Uh, so yeah, so but let's assume that the person that actually wants to get involved with this case, they'll they'll take your issue, and then they will go and they will talk with uh, other colleagues. And they will introduce this this bill as something to change the law. Uh, at that point in time, it's, it is it is an idea that they've introduced in the legislature. If your voice is not heard in this process, uh, it is just that legislator against. The other legislators and so let's just take a, a I'm gonna make this a simple process let's say that there are a hundred legislators in your in your body you mean house it, whatever body it could be city council okay it could be okay. it could be uh, the state legislature it could be Congress we or the Senate okay it could be Congress okay. Congress is 435 almost sound stupid on tape <laughs> 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 So let's say that there are 100 members in this body. In order to pass a statutory law, that's just a basic bill, it will take a simple majority. A simple majority is 51 votes. So it's not just my idea. It's my idea plus 50 other people saying, yes, this is a good idea. The most legislatures that I'm aware of in this state, in this country, that have black legislators 
in them don't have a majority of black legislators serving. So you have to build a coalition with other legislators to say we need to move this forward. A lot of times in our community we believe that once we hand it off to the policymaker, we're done. And then they come back and say, y'all don't do nothing up there. All y'all do is I've been talking, I see y'all having dinner and stuff. But the problem is, in order to move a piece of legislation, because we don't have the numbers, we have to build these coalitions. Okay. So that's why you hear uh, women's caucus, or the black caucus, or Republican caucus, or the Democratic caucus. You build these coalitions and say, we are collectively going to try to move internal legislation. These are, these are, these are in internally inside those bodies. Okay. But you hear about them out here in the street, but these are internal coalitions okay. that are trying to move legislation. Okay. And so what? Let's say that legislator were able to get convince them that this is a great idea. I, I actually have a great example of a great idea that didn't go anywhere. Would you like to hear it? Absolutely. Okay. So, um, uh, me and a former, uh, me and one of my former colleagues, um, we would go out to elementary schools and talk to kids. And the kids, uh, you know, it's hard for them to understand this process, but they actually were able, they were, they were engaged in the process. And these were elementary school kids. And so we asked them at the end, what would you like to see us do for you? And interestingly enough, the kids say, we want our parents to be more actively involved in our school. We said, that's a great idea. And so we took a bill and we, we created a bill that says that parents will have up to eight hours a year that they can get let off their jobs to go deal with their children's issues. Great. All y'all agree. Should, should happen. Point blank. We introduced that bill. And then we told the kids we're going to introduce it. And then we're going to let you follow this bill with us as it goes through the process. Oh, so you empowered them. We, we, we empowered the children to okay. say, stay with us. We're gonna, when we introduce it, we're going to let you know so whoever can come down to the Capitol get with your parents and we, you can watch us do that process. And as it goes through committee, we'll invite you to come to the committee and listen to the committee hearings. Could they testify? They could testify as well. They, could, they can come up to the mic and, and tell their story. So George is in the South, too. We actually kind of the belt buckle of the South, but anyway. We're in, the, we're, in the, we're in the South, and uh, we introduced that bill. Who do you think did not want to see that bill passed? We need to get off the front row. Uh, so? <laughs> well, at least they can hear the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, no employer? The, the chamber, the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, stood up against that particular piece of legislation, saying it has taken the power of the employer away from being able to determine whether or not a person can take off work or not. It was, it was only eight hours a year now. It's not like it's going to shut the company down, but they came against that. And so a great idea that didn't go forward because of how this thing was like, but there were a number of people who came up to us, both black and white, Republican and Democrat, saying it's a great idea, however, you know, we got the chamber out here against us. And guess who fund campaign? All right. So, so all of this is connected. So I, because I can't run for office if I can't raise money. I can't put y'all signs out. I can't go out and tell y'all how great I am. No TV. No TV, no TV radio. And then one of the other things that our community doesn't do, and that, so we talk about knocking on legislative doors. We also don't give to campaigns either. That's another, that's another problem. That's a, that's a podcast. That, that is. And, it, and it's not about giving somebody $500 or $250. It's $10. You don't have to give them. It, it is, those small checks mean more to a legislator than a $2,500 check from Walmart. Because we know Walmart can throw $2,500 away and won't even miss it. But you gave $10, that means something to you. And that means that you will come and you will engage in the process. That's that grassroots. That's the grassroots. Okay, we're gonna. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm get sorry, us back yeah. on track. We're getting excited. We're getting excited. Let's let's um, talk about lung cancer. Okay. What are some challenges in implementing policy related to lung cancer, and how would policy makers try to get over that? All right. So some of the challenges about dealing with policy. So we heard a lot of them today. Okay. So one of the, one of the biggest is is behavior. So there are a lot of people that actually want to smoke when uh, in 
the one of the thing one of the tools that a policymaker has is to be able to tax. So if you take tobacco and you say we're going to put a cigarette tax on tobacco, that is a policy decision to try to curtail access to this this uh, this deadly product. Uh, but people still will pay that extra amount of money to smoke cigarettes. And so this is about changing behavior. And one of the things that we can't do as policymakers is, is legislate morality. So people will do whatever they're going to do. But the other thing that we can do as policymakers is events like this, where we come out to the community, where we try to tell you about these things that are dangerous so that you can also advocate along with us to say, there are some policy changes that I can think of, kind of like with the school situation, that will help change the trajectory of people, how they access this dangerous uh, product. Then also, funding research. So your voice, uh, we just had the conversation about the clinical trial piece, but none of those clinical trials happen in the dark. Uh, a lot of these pharmaceutical companies spend in the B, billions of dollars to bring a drug to market. Now, a lot of people say, I don't want to participate in clinical trial. How many of you have taken uh, Motrin, Tylenol? Every last one of you were in the clinical trial when you did that. Because they didn't know how that drug was going to, since you were not in the trial, when you took it, they didn't know how it was going to affect you. And when you took it, if it worked for you, great. If it didn't, that was, that's what a clinical trial is. Then you, you had to go to the next. Then you go to the naproxen, I'm sorry, you go to Aleve or you go to something else. But then, but it is, that's. That's what the clinical trial process is. But you have to fund that. Policymakers can be big uh, influencers in ensuring that that funding exists, not only at the federal level, but these companies, pharmaceutical companies out here, actually put the amount of uh, research and development in these drugs. Also mandating the number of minorities that participate in these clinical trials. So that comes through actually through um, policy out of the White House through the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration being able to say, before this drug is approved, this many, this percentage of people of color need to participate in the clinical trial. I'm glad you said that. How, who's, how do they hold, hold them accountable for that? Who's holding them accountable for Who's that? the they? The, the folks that, the pharmaceutical companies, that they're having these clinical trials. So, it, it is the Food and Drug Administration. They, okay. they hold the pharmaceutical company, um, accountable for being able to make sure that the number of minorities that participate in clinical trials. The thing about it, though, right now is not policy. So the, there, is a, there is a strong recommendation that the Food and Drug Administration make sure that these clinical trials include minorities in their, uh, in their process. But there is no law. So this, again, this is about where your policy maker. There's no law. There's no, there's no formal policy that forces pharmaceutical companies to ensure that before a drug hits the market that 5%, 10% of that clinical trial's population were minorities. So they can say as long as they shared it. They that's, right, that, that's what they do. So pharmaceutical companies said, we offered, the, we, offered we came out to um, uh, Reverend Jefferson's church. We told them about clinical trials. They didn't sign up. We're done. Can't say nothing else about this now. And we don't want to be in that space either. I mean, and, and, and I don't think pharmaceutical companies out, a lo most of them are not out to do it. There are some that are actually that dirty, but, but most of them are, are really wanting to know uh, what this drug will do to our population. But we have to say we want to know too. And if we don't want to know and we don't participate, then that's, we get the standard of care. So we just got through talking about biomarker testing. And biomarker testing is the ability to see how this drug, how this cancer mutates in your body based on your gene structure and the, and, and the, the, uh, the gene structure of that particular mutation. They can then target the therapy that comes to you. And so for lung cancer, you can actually take a pill instead of taking chemo. Now. Roxy just shared that. Exactly. She just shared that. I take a pill to deal with my, my lung cancer. Now, there are some folks that don't go through that process. They don't go through the biomarker test, so guess what happens to them? They get chemo. Now, that, that, is, that is a rough way of now. Some people are getting healed through that process. I'm not going to tell people not to go through that process. But a better quality of life for you is to be able to have the latest and greatest, the newest therapy, the newest technology around this, this space. And one of the things that we're doing as policymakers is saying, 
for biomarker testing, it shouldn't be because you don't have insurance or because you're on Medicaid that you can't get access to this drug, that it should be made available to anybody that meets the criteria that they should get this without having to have to know about it and ask about it. It is a shame that we as a people, we got to know about stuff because folk ain't going to give it to us. Last question. Sure. Collaboration. How do we, how do, does the church, how does the community, how does doctors, what, how do we collaborate with our policymakers so that we can move policy that's going to pass that's, that's, that's a great question. We, um, we talked earlier about the 51 votes moving something and, that, and building these coalitions. Uh, collaboration is, is huge. Um, uh, Julie Spears talked about when we first got here about how uh, we, as an organization, HEAL works with the most trusted voice in the black community, which is the church. Faith-based organizations and, and communities of color have a huge voice, huge level of trust among individuals to say, if we're bringing this information to you, you can actually trust it and you can lean on it. Uh, community-based organizations like uh, American Cancer Society, uh, some of your fraternities and sororities, being able to come together to, to say, uh, we want to lend our voice too to say that this information this community needs to know about. You bring your policymaker to the table, you have this trifecta of individuals that can actually not only talk about why there is a need, but if there is a gap in how we can get uh, access to screening, how we can get access to these new therapies, that your policymaker can actually come in and bridge that gap. If we don't work collaboratively, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't work together, uh, we, if we don't work together better than what we're doing now, uh, we're gonna continue to get what we're getting now. And if we do, that's called insanity. It really is about us being able to say, to say we need to take a more active role in coming together, and let's, and let's I'm gonna get on this limb, and I'm gonna saw it off behind me, so that with me, but, uh, we, we can't let, let pettiness stop us from working together. Uh, a lot of us, I, you know what, I don't, I don't like the way she talked to me yesterday, so therefore, mm -hmm. I'm not going to learn nothing about what she, and this is about to save your life, and you're going to use, and I, I'm trying to make something real innocuous and simple, but really seriously, we cannot allow for pettiness between us to keep us from coming together to talk and work together for solutions that that will save our community. And right now, uh, again, as a former policymaker, a lot of my, most of my uh, pushback came from people who looked like me. Mm. And, and, and that was disappointing. But you don't do this thing, you don't do this kind of work if you don't love our people. Mm -hmm. you gonna, if you saw Dr. Fitzgerald Hug you. That, that, that didn't have anything to do with her degree. That didn't have anything to do with how, but it has everything to do with how she was raised. Yeah, empathy. Absolutely. And, and you don't do this unless you want. You love our people, and you do it in spite of. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have to work together to make this work. I'm going to give an opportunity. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, we got it. <laughs> Please come to the microphone. <laughs> And make it really difficult. I want him to think about it. I want him to think about it. I'm not sure if this is a question or comment, if you want to be offline with your answer. <laughs> Federal judge recently decided that the abortion pill mm -hmm. that had been approved for over 50 plus years through the CDC is being safe. Not asking you to say if you I, are ready. What impact do you feel a federal judge making that kind of decision, you see where I'm going with this question, I did, I did, I did. will have on us as citizens who are determining our, what we want our policies to be. I want to know how, would you, how do we bridge the gap or however you want to look at it between medicine and the federal government having that kind of control over what the CDC, which has always been our go-to when we come to medicine and approvals. Thank you. At that Awesome. That was an awesome question. Awesome. Um, I'm going to keep saying awesome before I try to bite my tongue. Um, our, our, our 
government in this country is you have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Here you had a place where there could have been a policy from the legislative branch about access to these medications that they failed to do that, which led the executive branch to make an executive decision around whether or not people can have access to this. And they have access to this through the Food and Drug Administration saying this drug is safe. This federal judge came back and said, based on my authority as a judge in the judicial system, that I can block access to this until there is legislative approval of the access of this, whether or not this drug can go forward or not. His decision, unfortunately, was based on medical advice that he should not have given, in my opinion, because he's not a medical person. He, he and, and this is where it gets to be tricky. And this is why you need um, the, the interface with, with your elected official. Um, a lot of these things that are, that are disproportionately affecting our community, none, a lot of them are not statutory. They're not, they're not put in law. And so they're either executive order. So you take the Civil Rights Act of 1965. That's not a law. It's not a law. And, and so we built our community around this, but every time that, you, that, that someone tries to make it a law, there is blockage for that. And there is reasons for why there's blockage for that. We're not going to talk about that because I'm going to take it. But uh, there are reasons why there are blockages for that. But it should be a law. It should be statute. Why are we, why are we not wanting to make this law? Why, why does it have to be reauthorized um, every 25 years? The... Um, the affirmative action piece and how that is being affected. And so these things are happening because they're not statutory. And, and a lot of this can be fixed in the legislative process. And our, our federal legislators are not wanting to touch this. You have state legislatures now who are hell-bent on in the church. That's right. They're hell-bent. They're trying to go um, on trying to stop people from having access to these, uh, these life-changing and life-saving medications. Um, I want to wrap up on that um, because I think it's important as we talk about biomarker testing. There is legislation happening right now in Texas on bio access to biomarker testing. It's Senate Bill 6, Nine. Senate Bill 989, thank you. Um, pay attention. Know that if this bill passes, that means it's going to be accessed available. And so in order to advocate for yourself, you have to educate yourself. And so partnering with the church, we'll make sure we provide resources and updates, but I just wanted people to understand, like we talked about so much information, but I want you to know that there is a light, there is information, there is access that is at the state legislators right now that they're fighting for Senate Bill 989. So we want to thank them for that work. Um, well, can I, can I mention something about that too? Oh, Senate, yeah. Senate Bill 989 is, is a bill that will give individuals access to biomarker testing with, uh, specifically through the, the state, uh, state Medicaid. The insurance lobby is fighting whether or not that this should go forward. So this bill was moved from the health committee to the insurance committee. Because the insurance, the insurance community does. So if you get access to biomarker testing, you got, you got Aetna, Blue Cross, or what have you, or United Healthcare, and, and it's gonna cost them more money. They're like, why, why do we need to pay for this? And so they're lobbying to say, no, this shouldn't happen. Your state legislators are now fighting to make sure that that's not the case. And so it may be one of the ways that this passes that it only affects governmental payers, which is Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, but eventually, it, it eventually the private fall right behind. So you, you have to make sure, sometimes you wait, you do the crack in the door first. Because the legislator, the policymaking process is iterative, so you want to make sure you go step by step. So, with that, um, so in the state of Georgia, we just passed this actual biomarker testing that allows for for Medicaid patients to have access to the biomarker testing. We know it's happened. It passed in Maryland. It is passing uh, in Ohio, as as we as we speak, and in Kentucky. Believe it or not. In, in tobacco country, they just passed this. So if they can do it, anybody can. 
And we worked on that legislation in Kentucky and in Georgia. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Mr. Mosby. Okay. Thank you so much. It has been my pleasure. Did you want to share something? Well, yeah, no. Uh, so uh, your, your congressperson, Sheila Jackson Lee, actually was kind of in this area, but she, she wanted to stop by if she could. But she gave um, some, actually some, some recognitions for, for the work that we're doing here today in this, in this space. And so I just want to, first of all, uh, one of the commendation letters that she sent was to uh, the South Texas, South Texas District Association. We want to give that to. Uh, we also, she also gave one for, for Reverend Jefferson. So he has one as well. And also for, for my friend and colleague, Reverend Jackson. You know, I leave you out. And then she finally gave one for uh, the Hill Collaborative for, for us doing this work with, uh, with, this, uh, with this ministry to bring this information to you all. And we want to thank her for her, her work and her, her thought about being able to make sure that, that this information goes forward to all of you all. That's wonderful. It is awesome. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you. One, one, one quick question. Um, now, how do we follow up on uh, this policy initiative? I know there's some uh, legislation presently in the uh, state house. Correct. Uh, but but how do we follow up? What is the what is the best way to follow up on on the, the initiatives, uh, the policy initiatives? So um, so real 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 the simple wise, you know, you can always go online and look at the legislative process that moves through. I but my thing is reach out to uh, your state legislators. So so Senator Boris Miles and um, Representative. John Terry to say, we want you to give us regular updates on where you are in this process so that we can, we can help you. We can help you pass this. You're, we can be down at the Capitol in force to let you, let the people know that we support this bill moving forward. But even, even if you can't show up down there, emails, mm -hmm. calls, mm -hmm. they make as much impact, well, about the same. Because I like to see, I like to see when you show up. I like to shake your hand. It means, it means a lot. Any other questions? Comments. I, or comments. I, 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 I know we're standing between you all at lunch. So I, want, I, I do also want to say thank you all for, I know we have some surveys out there, so if you haven't filled them out, please complete them. Your feedback and input on what we're doing and how we can move forward in communities is important so that it's not like we're doing something that's not going to, that you're not able to take away some tools and resources. So please um, make sure that you share all of all of the surveys, complete them, and so then give us any feedback um, or any any information that you want to share with us, with, with more information that you might need um, that we can help you with. Please let us know. And with that, I would like to um, ask um, Reverend Jackson, would you wrap us up, sir? Or, or Jackson? Which, which one? Oh, on? is it, who's, who? Jackson. Is it Jackson? Okay, I have you, Reverend. I have you, Leon Jackson. All right, thank you. We've had, um, we've had a wealth of information given to us today, um, almost like branches of a tree. You have one tree, but you have branches going different directions. So we've had a lot of information, and I uh, want to thank all of the um, attendees, those online as well as those in person, especially to our panelists. And, and uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, like uh, uh, Mr. Mobes, I want to say brother, has already stated. <laughs> brother Mosby. They'll be in church, so you know how that is. Uh, brother Mosby has already stated if, when you put your arms around her, that showed empathy. And, um, that, and, and Brother Darrell brought that conversation up also. Because we, it's good to know that uh, there are doctors who really care. Doctors who really care. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so thank you for being one of them and, and not afraid to show it. Uh, and to all of our panelists, thank you. Um, and to all of those who ask questions, we hope that, that your questions were answered. Um, I think you, um, Ms. Jones is collecting the pre and post surveys. If you have not completed them, please complete your pre and post survey and uh, give them to her. She's walking around now. Thanks again, everyone, to Pastor Jefferson, moderator Jefferson of, of this uh, South Texas Association, to P Pentecostal staff, and I've said this time and time again, I thank God for our moderator and the staff uh, that he has here at this church. Everything is so comfortable as well as convenient. Um, so thank you to the staff and to those of us from uh, Pentecostal Missionary Baptist Church. The HEAL Collaborative, what does that stand for again, H-E-A-L? Health, Education, Advocacy, Learning. All right. And to um, our sponsor, Amgen, thank, thankful for them. And Ms. Julia, Mr. Julius Spears, uh, I've known him, our families have known each other all of our lives. Uh, so thank God for him. Julius has been trying to get me to do this for years, and finally he got me. But I thank you, because I could not have done it without Reverend Jefferson, Pentecostal, and South Texas District Association. Thankful for some of my members being here this morning from St. Emmanuel, where I'm the proud yet humble pastor. God bless you. All right. I think that's all. I'm online. Oh, whatever. Thank you, Lisa, for giving me this script. <laughs> All right. Final prayer. Now, she didn't tell me what to pray for, so I'm on my own with the prayer. Amen. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, thank you again for all that we have seen, heard, and witnessed. Now, dear Father, we pray for the physicians, for their knowledge, and for uh, their testing and for their questions, for, for their bedside manners, as we used to call it. We pray for the physicians that you'd keep them safe as they take care of our physical needs. Dear God, help us also to be aware of their humanity and to uh, listen to what they have to say. We pray, dear Father, because there's a lot of disparity among us in, uh, as people, uh, there's a lot that's available to us, but yet we are not even aware of it. So we pray for those concerns and that you continue to make us advocates, that we be our own advocates. But dear God, you have to go between and before us because some things we just aren't aware of, some things we just have to leave in your hands. Have mercy upon us, dear God. Thank you again for the healing that you brought about even in this room. Some of the questions that have been asked, we pray for their answers. We pray, dear Father, for all of the discussions that have been made. Some have, all have not been about our health issues. It was also brought up about our Civil Rights Act. Dear God, have mercy. Now, dear Father, we pray that I bless the food that has been prepared for the nourishment and strength of our bodies. Again, take care of each and every one of us individually, every church that's represented every city, every state, every county that's represented in this meeting. We pray for safe travels as we return to our various destinations, but dear Father, across the street is too far to go without you. So again, we pray that I go with us and stand by us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, you are dismissed. And I think everyone knows where the fellowship hall is. We will have Dinner, lunch is prepared for us there. Amen. God bless all of you.
And we are back with more of What's Now, taking our attention to health and wellness.
And we are back with more of What's Now, taking our attention to health and wellness, especially lung cancer. I recently spoke with two individuals who have had lung cancer and very different experiences and journeys, and they have some great insight. Let's take a look. You've been diagnosed with lung cancer, so what now? What do you need to ask? Where can you go? And how can you find the newest treatment options? Unfortunately, lung cancer is a leading cause of death among black Americans. And here to talk more about this is Dr. Sydney Barnes and Brandy Bryant, both lung cancer survivors. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Dr. Barnes, let's start with you. You are a lung cancer patient and a doctor. Tell us about your story. I noticed when I started residency that my exercise tolerance was um, diminishing. I was becoming more short of breath. I am normally a very active person. I dance, swim, run track. And I realized that I was just getting more and more short of breath. And then I started wheezing. Now, I do have a very strong family history of asthma, so I thought that was what was going on. But I decided to go to a pulmonologist to get checked out. And after a whirlwind of tests, I actually got diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer, which was completely shocking to me because I have no risk factors for lung cancer. Thankfully, they sent my um, tumor off for biomarkers and I was um, found to have a biomarker. So I started on targeted therapy and I was able to complete my residency working 80 hour weeks and continue working and living a very normal life. And now I'm no evidence of disease five years after the fact, which is amazing. That is amazing. Brandy, you're also a lung cancer patient and you're doing very well on targeted therapy because you found out about your biomarker. Tell us about that. So my story is similar to Dr. Barnett's. I was um, 39 years old, very busy mom of four. I had a tiny cough for months that I didn't think anything of. It was, it was really quite minor. But um, after, and I was active, I liked to take long walks, walking like 25 miles a week. And, but after the walks, I noticed shortness of breath um, when I was just having conversations. So that prompted me to go to the doctor. Uh, after a series of tests, I was diagnosed with stage 3B lung cancer. I was initially diagnosed at a local community hospital, but I was very fortunate that they did send my tumor off for biomarker testing. I had no idea what that meant. Um, and I still had to, uh, because I was stage three when I was initially diagnosed, I had to do chemo and radiation. However, when I progressed a few months or, or just two months later, I um, had the choice of doing immunotherapy or targeted therapy. Um, but because I knew what my biomarker was, ALK positive, I knew to choose to immuno, I mean, targeted therapy because immunotherapy doesn't work well for ALK and a lot of biomarker driven cancers. But um, it's, it's definitely made things uh, much better for me. I had a young, my youngest kid was three. I couldn't climb the stairs. I couldn't do anything. And once I started taking the targeted therapy, I felt markedly better within just a couple of weeks. Like the fluid was draining from my heart and everything was feeling better. And I've been no evidence of disease since 2018. Dr. Barnett, tell us exactly what a biomarker is and why patients need to ask their doctors about them. So each cancer is unique and some cancers have mutations that are driving the cancer to progress. And that is what the biomarker is. Uh, a biomarker is a mutation that is driving this cancer. There are many different biomarkers such as EGFR, KRAS, ROS1. Uh, Brandy and I are both ALK positive, so our mutation is ALK. And what a targeted therapy is, it literally, literally zooms in on that mutation and turns the mutation off. Um, it's so much better tolerated than chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, it actually works much better for um, these mutations uh, than the chemotherapy. And because of that, a lot of patients are able to lead pretty normal lives with it, um, which I think is one of the reasons why research is just so important. 
had this had we been diagnosed 10 15 years ago we wouldn't be here mm -hmm. um and now we need to know what further therapies are out there and what reasons people are getting um cancer so that we can potentially save more lives brandy would it have made a difference in your treatment and in your quality of life if you had known your biomarker earlier I was fortunate to know my biomarker earlier. I just did not qualify for the treatment at the stage. At that time, I didn't qualify for the treatment at the stage that I was initially diagnosed, but it definitely made a difference whenever I progressed to stage four. Knowing that I had that biomarker gave me a treatment that actually saved my life because immunotherapy does not work. It actually yeah. It has the opposite effect on ALK positive and uh, some other biomarker driven cancer. So without that, I wouldn't be here <laughs> today. So biomarker testing was extremely important and is if you're newly diagnosed. Yeah. And Dr. Barnard, how can people be screened for lung cancer and who should be screened? So right now, the screening criteria is geared towards smokers. Um, if they smoke uh, one pack of cigarettes a day for more than 20 years, um, if they are between the ages of 50 and 80, if they stop smoking, you know, less than 15 years ago, they do qualify for a low dose CT for screening for lung cancer. However, I do implore anyone, anyone who has uh, a persistent cough that won't go away, anyone who's wheezing without any history of asthma, anyone who has been treated for pneumonia more than once and the symptoms are, is not going away, I would implore them to speak to their doctor about getting screened for lung cancer because these are some of the symptoms that a lot of lung cancer patients who have no known risk factors are presenting with. And the earlier that we find the lung cancer, the better it is. Brandy, when you learned about lung cancer, were you surprised about how little federal funding is earmarked for lung cancer? I was very shocked um, to learn about that as I got into lung cancer advocacy because for me, the the drug that I started taking, the targeted therapy, just came on the market two months prior, um, and that's due to research. And if we if we don't have the research funding, then we can't get these drugs to help people with this number one cancer killer. Um, you know, I want to be here for many, many years with my children and my family. You want to be with the yep. ones that you love. We, we want to be here and we want to help newly diagnosed people have hope. And, and you have hope when you see people like us, yes. <laughs> right? So the, the more research funding we can get, the more that we can get these therapies and treatments that'll help us be here longer. And Dr. Barnard, tell us more about why someone who has lung cancer would join a clinical trial and how people can participate. So one of the things I want patients to know is clinical trials are safe and clinical trials are the way that we learn the therapies of tomorrow today. Um, it, it tells us how we can learn more about the cancer, what is driving the cancer, and research is what gave us where we are right now. And if the traditional therapies um, are not working anymore, if chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy, targeted therapy are no longer working, then it is so much better for you to go into a clinical trial to find out what can prevent your progression, um, further progression from happening. Now, if my cancer was to come back and was not responsive to things that were on the market, I would definitely go into a clinical trial. And that is one of the things that I want people to know. Clinical trials are definitely the way moving forward if you are not able to do any other therapy. And Brandy, any other advice for our viewers and where can we find more information? So yes, uh, the advice I'd like to give is uh, if you're newly diagnosed, please ask your doctor what is your biomarker. And if you want more information, you can visit lcfamerica.org where there is information on the different types of biomarkers, treatments, clinical trials, and more research, which is critical. Um, so lcfamerica.org. Well, thank you so much, Brandy, Brian, and Dr. Sydney Barnard for joining us today. Really appreciate your time and how thoughtful you've presented this information and shared your story. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome to Chronic Love, a supportive space for people with chronic illness. I'm Robin, a psychologist in New York City navigating the fallout of a breast cancer diagnosis some years in. And I'm on a personal journey to join together with others who have similarly found themselves facing life challenges in the wake of chronic illness. Together, with the generous humans you're about to meet, we welcome you into our discussions. I just remember feeling like, what the hell did I do? You know, like, how is it that, how, yeah. you know, like I, I didn't even smoke. I never did hard drugs. I really lived a straight and narrow life. So I'm like, I don't understand what I did and why all of a sudden now this is my story. How did you come to understand your illness, the severity of your illness? Is it okay if we talk a little bit about that? The only way for me to really talk about that is to kind of go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, because I got, my diagnosis was, <laughs> the, the whole procedure was crazy. Um, yeah. So if, if you don't mind, I'll start at the beginning of how I got diagnosed and answer your question along the way, if that's okay. <laughs> is that okay? That's perfect. Yeah. And April of 2018, I developed this, this wheeze um, that really was, it was, you know, not really that bad. It was something that only popped up when I would go to sleep at night, I would lay down to go to bed. And, you know, I would just have this little, <laughs> like wheezy cough or whatever, and it would go away, you know, and then I would fall asleep and everything was fine. It then expanded into something that happened more regularly. So then it started happening when I wasn't going to sleep, it started happening when I was getting off the subway. Um, mind you, all this is taking place in New York. I was diagnosed in New York. Um, but it started happening on the subway. It would happen when I went into work. It would happen when I was sitting at my desk, when I was at home. And it became a thing where I was trying to pinpoint, maybe it's something in the atmosphere. Maybe it's like allergies. Maybe it's the HVAC system. I'm, I'm trying to figure out all these different reasons why this wheeze has now started to follow me around. And then I decided, uh, you know, I got a cold and the cold went away, but the wheeze stayed. And of course, in this day and age, we Google everything. And so I, of course, Googled, you know, what happens if your cough stays and your cold goes away and they're like, oh, it's bronchitis. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I have, you know, bronchitis. And so very nonchalantly, I went to the doctor just to see what was going on. And he was like, okay, well, you know, here's a breath test. And he, they gave me the breathalyzer test where you like breathe into a tube and it determines what your lung capacity is. So if you have asthma or allergies or whatever, so I took that test and it came back sort of inconclusive for either of the two. And so he was like, okay, well, I'm just going to give you this inhaler. And whenever you feel like you have to wheeze, just use the inhaler and you should feel better. And he's like, come see me in two weeks and let me know how you're feeling. I didn't really think anything of it, of course. And so I, I actually uh, used the inhaler for two weeks, came back to him and I was like, it's not helping. It's not really helping at all, to be honest with you. And so he was like, all right, well, I'm going to write you a script for a cough suppressant. And, and then he just sent me on my way. That was it. There was no x-ray. There was no further communication. It was just, you know, oh, the inhaler didn't work. Okay, well, let's get rid of your cough. And here's a, here's a medicine for that. And he just kind of let me go. At that point, I just realized like I wasn't really getting any help from him and I wasn't really getting any answers. And so I kind of just kept on living my life, you know, for a little while. I was, you know, 30 years old at this point. So in a relationship, you get that. 30 year old metabolism and comfortable relationship weight. And I was like, Oh, no, I, I got to start getting into the gym. Um, but for me, I, I never really liked going to the gym. And I wanted something more interactive. And so I ended up getting into kickboxing. And mm -hmm. So I was doing a lot of high intensity cardio. And so I started to, you know, as my symptoms developed more, I started to attribute them to the high intensity workout that I was doing, you know, so the wheezing turned into a cough and some shortness of breath which I assumed was, oh, you know, kickboxing, it's intense, you know, I'm not used to this kind of working out. And then the shortness of breath um, turned into, you know, some back pain. And I just started, I was making excuses for all of these symptoms that I had. But I started to know that something was really wrong. There's always that turning point where you realize like, okay, this is the thing that lets me know something is wrong. 
Um, and that point for me was uh, being in the gym with my, you know, at the time he was my boyfriend. Now he's my husband, but we were on the treadmill and, you know, I'm not the most in shape person, but I know that I can run a mile and be okay. Mm -hmm. And so I got on the treadmill and I was running right alongside him and I got to about a quarter of a mile. And I was like, <sighs> like, I had to stop. I was like, I have, I'm not breathing. And it's like, it's, it wasn't like one of those things where, you know, if you're a runner, you hit that runner's high and you're kind of good to go. It was like, no, I'm actually not getting enough oxygen. Like I really, I have to stop. And I realized at that point that something was really wrong. And he was like, you know, you need to get a second opinion. You know, you, you need to go get this checked out. And I was like, all right. And so I made my second opinion appointment. And because I'm a new patient, you know, they kick new patients out, you know, a month or two, like for whatever reason, doctors are always a month or two booked. Um, and so I didn't get my appointment until about December. Um, so remember all of this started in April. Yeah. Um, and so December came around and I went to my appointment and I told him what was going on and what was happening. And he was like, well, have you had an x-ray? And I was like, no, nobody's giving me a chest x-ray at all. And he was like, okay, well, go upstairs and get a chest x-ray. And he's like, and when you come back downstairs, we can talk about the results. And I was like, okay. He was kind of shocked. He's like, why have you not had an x-ray? And I'm like, no doctor has sent me to get an x-ray. <laughs> you know, I just was like, no, I just never had one. So I went upstairs. I got the x-ray. I came back downstairs. And I'll never forget the look on his face. It was like all the blood had drained from his face. And he was like pale. He's like, are you feeling Okay. And I was like, I mean, yeah, it's like, I'm tired, but I'm always tired. So I was like, but I feel fine. And he's like, your entire left lung is covered in fluid. And I was just like, what? And he showed me the x-ray and I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely, I was just shocked. I was like, I don't, I don't understand how this is even possible. And he's like, well, I need to admit you to the hospital like right now. And I was like, whoa, okay, wait, <laughs> hold on a sec, time out, pause, wait. I was like, I was not expecting, you know, I'm not ready to get admitted into the hospital. I had a whole bunch of stuff going on. I was just like, whatever this is, it's got to wait another three days. It's just got to make it through the weekend. And so he was like, well, in the meantime, let me send you for a CT scan so we can see if this is fluid or if it's, you know, a mass. So I went in and uh, got the CT scan done. And then I kind of went on about my business all through the weekend. And I went to work on Sunday. And I remember that day being like particularly difficult. I just was like, I really don't feel good today. You know, like uh, my back was hurting. I was shortness of breath. I was tired. I think it was like, it's like, you know, they call it that, like, it doesn't hurt until you look at it type situation. Yeah. You know, I was perfectly fine until I got the scan. And then all of a sudden I was like, I just don't feel good now. I was like, now my body was like, we know something's wrong. And so let's start, you know, broadcasting it. Um, but anyway, so on Sunday I called the doctor and I was like, what was the result of my CT scan? You know, like, what's the situation? And they were like, you need to come in ASAP. And my best friend, um, at the, my best friend Chardet was like, so you're going, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go. She's like, no, no, you're going to go tomorrow. I'm going to come up tonight and you're going to go tomorrow, right? And I was like, yes, yes, I'm going to go. You know, best friends are always like, get your behind to the hospital. Yeah, um, thank goodness. <laughs> so she came up to New York and um, we went into the hospital and I ended up being in the hospital for six days and they gave me a chest tube. It was awful. Um, I was awake for it and I felt every bit of it, but they gave me a chest tube and they drained two and a half liters of fluid out of my left chest capacity area. I was basically carrying around like a two liter bottle of soda in my chest somehow and functioning. Um, so they, they drained that much fluid out. It took about three and a half days before it was finished. And they were finally able to, to take the, uh, take me off the machine or whatever. Um, but while I was getting the lung drains, they tested the fluid. At first they told me I was fine. At first they were like, yeah, the fluid tested fine. There was no malignancy. You're good to go. Like, we're just going to drain this and, and you'll be fine. And I was like, oh, okay, great. Phew. You know, like, thank goodness. Then they came back and they were like, no, actually your fluid is testing positive for malignancy. And I was like, well, malignancy is cancer, isn't it? And they were like, yeah. And I was just like, what? Like it, none of it, like none of it made sense. I couldn't comprehend. People don't lie. When they say they have out of body experiences, it's real. Like you really experience things from outside yourself. Like you're watching yourself get this news and you're like, what is really happening to me right now? Yeah. Um, and so when they drain, finished doing the lung drain, um, they, the lung didn't fully inflate because the fluid had crushed my lung down into like a ball like this. And so once they pulled the fluid out, the lung was working on expanding. And so they were like, oh, there's some spots on there that we don't like. We're going to do a biopsy and, and test and see what's going on. And I was like, okay. But in the meantime, they were like, we're going to send you home. So 
I went home with this, this knowledge that I have something going on with me, something cancerous going on with me. I don't know what it is. And I have to wait five days for the biopsy test to come back. Mm -hmm. So that was December 15th or so. December 20th, I had an appointment to go sit down and see what was going on. And that was when they told me, yeah, you have cancer. It's lung cancer. Um, you know, but we went ahead and did genetic testing and it's a biomarker, you know, biomarker testing and it's out positive. You know, you're going to take some pills. Everything's going to be fine. Totally, totally nonchalant. I mean, we were joking in the doctor's office. He was like, you know, you should switch to a plant-based diet. And I was like, oh man, I love my steak. And he's like, yeah, no more steaks. Like, we're just joking and having a, a grand old time. Like he didn't just tell me that I have, you know, a cancer diagnosis, but I walked out of his office thinking that I had some mild form, you know, of cancer and I was going to take some pills and, you know, do some treatment and everything would be okay. And I had no idea. And so I left and, you know, kind of went home and mm -hmm. honestly, I can't tell you, I don't, I don't remember what my thought process was after that. Honestly, I really just don't, I don't recall, but I know I started getting shortness of breath a couple of days later. And so I panicked because I was like, oh no, <laughs> now I'm on like terror alert orange at all times for my breathing patterns. I'm like, I'm, I'm very much aware if I'm having breathing issues. Yeah. And so this was right between Christmas and New Year's. And so I started having the shortness of breath again and I wanted to see my doctor, but he was, you know, away because it's Christmas, you know, he's with his family. Yeah. So I went to my original pulmonologist, the one that did my first original chest scan and let me know that there was something wrong. And so I went to him and I was like, Hey, you know, I'm, I got an appointment. I sat down. I was like, I'm having shortness of breath again. I just, just wanted you to check and do an x-ray and see if, if like I'm good and, and what's going on. Um, and he's like, Oh yeah, with stage four cancer, you know, you're going to run into that a lot. And I was like, I'm sorry. What did you just say to me? Yeah. And he was like, yeah, this is stage four cancer. Did nobody tell you that this is stage four cancer? Rob and I burst into tears. Like I've never burst into tears before. I burst into tears in his office. He mentioned it so casually in conversation. Like he was asking me if I wanted cheese on my hamburger, you know, like it, he was like, yeah, stage four cancer. It happens all the time. I was like, <sighs> you know, like nobody, nobody said, nobody staged me in my, in my original doctor's appointment. Um, and so I got that news and, and I think I was in shock, you know, and I was like, of course I'm asking questions and I'm like stage four. I was like, how was this stage four? I'm like, that's like, that's like end stage. Like that's, there's no more higher stages than stage four. I'm like, what are you, what are you even talking about right now? I was like, what is my life expectancy? And he's like, well, we've seen people live anywhere from, you know, three to six years. I'm like six years. I was like, are you trying to tell me that I'm not going to live to see 40 right now? Like I was, I was going through it in his office. And I just remember, you know, I, I just remember feeling like, 